I don't think I can do it. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think I can do it. I, maybe I can. Oh, but it, here's the thing. It's just really boring. All right. I don't know if you've ever heard phone-ins about low traffic neighbourhoods. It's just some something something plant pots, something something CCTV something something plant pots, something. And then so if you live in one, you quite like them because you don't have tool, uh, boy racers tooling up and down your street anymore or people cutting through to get to school. And if you don't live in one, you probably don't like them because it takes you ages to get somewhere now. Or even if you do live in one and it, you, you can't go that way, but you can go to... I mean, I, I don't think I can... I'm sorry. I think I've, I think I've... I don't know. Have I let you down? Would you... Well, I'll tell you what. Let's never say never, all right? Let's not rule it out completely. Let, let's, let's keep our options open. But I just sat here in the news and I thought to myself, really, the notion of a government coming out now with uh, big plans to expand North Sea oil drilling, um, I, I, I just think it's more important, really, isn't it? I know that you could probably... You could frame them as part of a culture war, I suppose. I think Ed Miliband has suggested that they're just trying to turn the climate into the, the new front in the so-called culture war. I'm still not entirely clear what a culture war is, to be honest with you. Once, once you, If you leave transgender issues out of the equation completely, it just seems to be a, 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 a conversation about racism, really. Some people on one side think racism's great. And the rest of us think it's pretty awful. And that's, that's your culture war. There, there it is. Um, but I, I don't know, maybe I'm missing the nuance and the, and the detail of the issue. But climate, I know, understand climate, turning climate into a culture war does work. Because telling people that they can do whatever the hell they want and sod the consequences is quite effective politically. There's an awful lot of people out there who want to be told that they, could, they should be able to do whatever the hell they want and stuff the consequences. And, and on the other side, you've got people saying things like, well, you know, it'd be nice if... If humanity didn't sort of end early, it'd be nice if people weren't essentially burning parts of the world that have never seen fires on the scale that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. It'd be nice if if that didn't happen a lot, wouldn't it? And, and maybe we could make a bit of a difference if we did this, that and the other. Certainly, I mean, a government can make a much bigger difference than I can by recycling my tuna tins or whatever it may be. I, so I, I mean, that's a culture war, but it's so... Do you know what? I, would, I don't know if I should tell you this. Hello, by the way. I hope you've had a nice couple of weeks. As you can tell, I'm quite bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. It won't last, but uh, but I have quite high energy levels at the moment. Um, I I think I've, I was going to do it. I wrote a lot while I was away. The reason why I'm in quite a good mood, for those of you who care, is because I think my, my book will actually be finished almost on time. So uh, uh, give it another few days, and hopefully it'll be champagne corks popping all around. But... It's called How They Broke Britain, right? And it, it explains the madness of the last few years. Well, going back decades, but really the last few years. And I'm, I'm toying with the idea of doing a postscript. So have a look around. Look at everything they've broken, everything they've set fire to, everything they've screwed up. Did you see the front page of the Mail yesterday? Amazing story about a dis desperate, despicable plot by those pesky European unions to start controlling their borders. That they're going to insist on checks and um, uh, examinations before we can go there. As if, you know, that isn't what was actually negotiated by David Frost and Boris Johnson. But anyway, everywhere you went, the economy, whatever it is, absolute carnage. What a mess. What a bunch of clowns. And that's what the book's about. And, and I'm thinking of doing a two-line postscript. So you get to the end where it says, the end, and then you turn the page. Should I tell you this? I don't know. Should I tell you I mean... You don't think I should tell you this? Because I mean, well, I have. I'm, I'm there. It's going to sound weird if I don't now, isn't it? After building it up in this way. And I think the postscript needs to be: Oh, I don't want to alarm you, but all of the people I've just written about, they're now turning, having essentially broken Britain. They're now turning their attention to, to climate change. The same people, the same forces, the same think tanks, the same journalists, the same newspapers, the same proprietors, the same vested interests, the same plutocrats. They're now determined. The same politicians. They're now dedicating all of their energy to persuading the population that governments shouldn't be doing anything with regard to net zero or with regard to minimising climate change impact or, or at least trying to achieve some sort of equilibrium. It's the same people. I sometimes look at this stuff and think, am I the one that's gone bonkers? 
Because it's the same people. They, they've sold you this nonsense. And now they're turning their attention, having broken a country, they now want to essentially turn their nefarious attentions to an entire planet. And you, and you think it's the same blooming people. So that might be the postscript, although I probably won't use the word blooming. Um, so should we see if that, should we do that? I know, listen, I was in Greece for a fortnight. I flew there. I, I'm conscious of the fact that we should all be going everywhere by pedalo these days in order to be able to retain the right to express any concerns whatsoever about climate change. I, I, I think, you know, once a year on a plane is, is, is our limit at the moment, I think. I, even that's probably too much. But that's not what the conversation is going to be about today. The conversation is going to be about the government's decision to drill in the North Sea. And I, I'd like to have a thoughtful conversation we may do low traffic networks, uh, um, low traffic neighbourhoods at 11 or possibly 12 or, or maybe never. Um, what, what intrigues me about this is the grey area. So Ed Miliband can talk about a culture war on climate to make up for 13 years of failed Tory energy policy. But when Rishi Sunak talks about energy security, I do, I do find myself nodding along. I do find myself thinking I'd rather that we weren't dependent on, for example, Vladimir Putin or Saudi Arabia or, or, or other Gulf states. I'd, I'd rather that we did actually have a little bit more energy security of our own. And then another voice pops up in my... Well, well played, Tony. Tony says, welcome back, James. Those low traffic neighbours, they're just a load of bollards. Uh, I... Another voice pops up in my head that says, yes, well, you can be energy secure, you can improve or you can enhance energy security without going after more fossil fuels. Um, and, and that's where there is genuine clear blue water between Labour and the Conservatives on this. The um, 13 years, if you like, a failed Tory energy policy, as Ed Miliband puts it, you, you, you could be improving energy security by doing more sustainable energy couldn't you uh, th so I, i've got I, i've got a genuine question here it's not a particularly sophisticated question it's it's you know the, the the hardy perennial of radio phoning questions it's what do you think about this because the the the, uh, the reason i mentioned that i was in greece was because the fires were, were spectacular and awful. Now, Greece is no stranger to forest fires. They, they often happen. And I saw some speculation or possibly even reports, forgive me, I was on holiday, that some of them may have been started by arsonists, which some very stupid people, and I say that with great affection, some very stupid people take that as evidence that the climate change argument is being exaggerated. The point that, if you'd allow me to explain very briefly for anyone who is capable of understanding the simplest concepts but has somehow signed up to the it was arson argument, the point is that if I set fire to that little bit of scrub there, that little tree, right, I set fire to that little tree there, then in a world that hasn't been changed by climate change, that the fire would not spread at a rate of knots through tinder dry foliage and uh, forests that have uh, received less rain than they've received in generations. That, that's the point. It doesn't really matter how it starts. It's what happens to the spark. Where does the spark go? Does the spark turn into acres and acres and acres of immolation and, and burning? Or does it, does it peter out relatively quickly because the ground is moist or the or the or the do you see what i mean the climate hasn't dried out hasn't desiccated acres so so there it is that's that's the point and being in greece and watching it on the news it's reported slightly differently it's, it, it, but but the the reality of british tourists being well small boated off Greek beaches while you're in Greece, I think probably resonates slightly differently from how it resonates if you're still back in Blighty, if you're still at home. The um, the notion of, of British tourists having to flee in small boats, uh, temporary refugees, if you like, is incredible. And yet you flick through much of the British media and, and it gets reported, well, in very strange ways. And, and I get back, from a fortnight away and the first story I come across on my first day back at work is that UK Prime Minister wants to start drilling for more oil and turn it into, if you pardon the pun, and turn it into a political hot potato. So when you heard the news that Rishi Sunak, and, and th this, this is not something that you can necessarily 
turn into I don't want to turn it into a lazy argument. All right, I I, I want you to answer this question quite specifically. Ready? Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three is the number you need. What I want you to tell me is what came into your mind. What was your initial reaction this morning to the news that Rishi Sunak was going to issue hundreds of new licenses off the coast of Scotland. So I I guess if you're in Scotland, this gives you particular pertinence. Hundreds of new licenses off the coast of Scotland um, for drilling, for gas and oil drilling. Plans to expand North Sea oil drilling announced what 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 went through your mind what was your first thought keep it clean you know uh, I, I don't want any silliness uh, but it doesn't have to be deadly serious either uh, it certainly doesn't have to be scientific because who here is fully qualified to comment from a scientific point of view but there, there are two strands to this conversation as the personal and the political and i think that the question i've just asked you might actually allow us to to ride both horses because we are in Britain. We are most of us British. What do you feel about being in a country that is now stepping up the mining of fossil fuels? Stepping up the mining of fossil fuels. When you, you glance towards Canada or Southern Europe and you see some of the consequences of, of burning this stuff so much. And on the other hand, the politics of it. I find the energy security argument pretty persuasive, pretty convincing. The idea that Rishi Sunak is now desperately, desperately scrambling around for anything upon which they might be able to hang a few votes is pretty clear. But when it comes to the climate, when it comes to the single most issue our species will face in our lifetimes, what went through your mind when you heard this morning, you turned on your radio, opened your newspaper, flicked on the telly, had a look at Twitter, whatever it may be. Can we still call it Twitter? Is that, is that no? We had a, had a look at X, went on threads, whatever it may be. And you heard that the Prime Minister has announced an expansion of oil and grass drilling in the North Sea amid yada, yada, yada. Uh, I'll, I'll answer the question first. It's not a particularly sparkling insight. I said, well, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. <laughs> that, that's what I, you can tell I've been on holiday. I'm not very pungent, not very, not very powerful, no blistering takedowns or demolitions. Uh, the, 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 the social media team will be earning their beans. They'll be earning their corn today <laughs> for as long as my good mood sustains. I just thought, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. I've, I've just come back from a country that's on fire, and I've landed in one that is now expanding oil and gas drilling in the North Sea. I'll tell you what, I haven't got a new catchphrase. Hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 6060 973. 18 minutes after 10 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, fairly self-explanatory headline. The Prime Minister has announced an expansion of oil and gas drilling in the North Sea. What do you make of that? Alex is in Newcastle to kick things off. Alex, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Thanks for having me on again. This is a complete and utter betrayal of all young people. How the hell can you get net zero by burning oil and gas? This makes zero I, sense. It I does can not answer that. To our energy security. I can no, answer. you can't. I, this no, is you not can. They're, going, they're going to store it in enormous bottles no, underneath the... No, what? It doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work. Yet. We are hoping to invent carbon capture. We are hoping that we're going to Can jump you talk me through that for people? The, 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 hang on a minute. So somebody will invent the parachute along the way. Yeah, I like this. That's a brilliant analogy. Consider it stolen. People who don't know, because you did use the word again when you came on, which means I, I, I should tell people that you are a climate scientist. You've worked in this I field am, yeah. for, for your entire adult life. So there are two elements that we need to explore with the benefit of your expertise, because the first is the claim by Rishi Sunak that you can create huge amounts of carbon dioxide from the sectors that can't go net zero yet, like aviation or steel production or, or, or whatever else it may be, and then just store it in big holes under the sea. Now, that sounds like I've put a simplistic spin on things, but that, I think, is a fairly accurate description of what carbon capture, the other part of the announcement that we're expecting today, involves. How can you, Alex, state with confidence that it doesn't work? Because there's so many scientific reports about it. There's also so many scientific reports saying that by 2030, we're expected to have one billion people live in conditions which are uninhabitable. Do you understand what that means, James? We cannot yes. wait for net zero by 2050. 
Yes, it means a refugee crisis, the scale of which the world has never seen before. Exactly. So uh, why the hell are we pushing ahead with this instead of trying to insulate homes, instead of trying to get cheaper public transport, instead of trying to get renewable energy? Renewable energies, solar and wind, they can be built in a matter of months. It's going to take 28 years on average to get oil and gas from the North Sea. 28 years. That's not helping us now, is it? Most of Southern Europe is on fire. People in New York couldn't go outside because of wildfires in Canada. Cannot believe I have to spell this out. I'm sorry, James. I'm just very angry. Well, I, I picked up on that. And, and you, you, you sort of drive a bit of a coach and horses through my traditional attempts to be to try and keep things a little bit lighthearted, even when we're discussing we deadly, deadly serious subjects. No, I, I, I'm, I'm acknowledging He's that you're right and I'm wrong. by doing this. What do you what what explains it then, Alex? Step back if you can from your field of expertise, mm-hmm. and, and I, I, let me give you an analogy. So I like your parachute jumping out of a plane in the hope that someone's invented a parachute by the time we land. Uh, I remember mm-hmm. when Boris Johnson was uh, shutting fire stations, or when Theresa May was getting rid of police officers, and I, I used to defend them sort of by suggesting it can't be as bad as the critics suggest because their house could catch fire as well or they could be victims of crime as well. So they can't be behaving as stupidly and as cynically as critics contend because they too will be affected by the cuts that they're bringing in. And obviously the explanation that you're much more likely to, to be the, uh, the recipient of that kind of nightmare if you're poor or... There were lots of... Art, but do, do you see what I mean? If it is as clear as you describe, yeah. then what on earth are the politicians playing at? What do you think is going on? I can I can answer this really quite clearly because it is really quite clear, okay? Sure. Yes. Last year, 2022, the government received £3.5 million pounds in donations from oil and gas lobbyists and climate change deniers. So they are just doing... Th- pounds. That's not much money. I, I'm, not, I'm not being glib now. In the great scheme of things, it's, 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 a, it's a pittance. That is a lot. That's from one year alone. Did this you say million or billion? M- million. With a muh. Yeah, that's, that's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money for individual people. For the what was it two hundred people that are in government or the Conservative Party? Yeah, of course, that's a lot of money. You mean donations to MPs as opposed to the Conservative? Yeah, yeah it's quite that's a lot, but it's about, so you genuinely just think he who pays the piper calls the tune. Yes, absolutely. And, and they are they and are secondly, in, in hock because that, that explains the think tanks. We know that some of the so called think tanks, yes. the, the lobby groups masquerading as think tanks, are in recipient in receipt, even though they keep their funding secret. Some of it comes leaks through from American tax returns. So we know some of them are in receipt of, of funding from fossil fuels. We can presume that they all are until they tell us otherwise. And and it is literally here's some money. You promote the policies that are going to threaten the yep. very survival of the species because it. If, yeah. They're all that short-sighted. It's as simple as that. You say this is going to affect them too. Honestly, it's not really. This is going to affect the poorest people first, as we are already seeing. The people in the global south, in Africa, in Indonesia, and the people who are struggling with energy bills right now, the people who are not going to be able to afford food when crops start failing. They're going to be fine. They're going to be holed up in some bunker in New Zealand. And you remind me of the final act of that film don't you of, of don't look up that leonardo dicaprio film which haunts me this actually is exactly is they yeah. get in a spaceship they get into the richest people get in a special spaceship and go off to some brave new world alex thank you and thank you for your passion actually i, I think perhaps it was necessary at the top of the hour and, and it's all very well me patting myself on the back about coming back from holiday in a good mood but you you, you remind us that this is not really the sort of subject for um for equilibrium and calm thank you louise is in dartford louise what would you like to say well, the first thing um, that I thought when Richie Sunak announced this was it just reminded me of how Liz Trump uh, gave Liz, Liz Trust, sorry, gave all the you know the funding to Shell and um, the petrochemical industry instead of reducing our bills. You know, so I, don't follow, I, don't, I, don't quite, I don't quite follow. What did she do? So I think when there was a, a discussion, didn't she? Didn't she give? Well, you're supposed extra to be telling funding? me. Not, you're supposed to be telling well, me. Not asking oh, yeah. me. I can't remember. So, okay. so, but, but to so, tie in with what Alex so, said, you're suggesting that they are hand in glove with the fossil fuel yeah. establishment, they if are. you like. The fossil they fuel are, fuel. yeah, definitely. But what I'd also like to say is that diesel, when he invented his engine, he um, invented it so it could run on. I can't remember if it's seven or nine different types of fuel. Well, can you check these don't... things before you ring yes, in next no, time, please? No, I, I mean, honestly, this. Just, if this, this was your homework, no, you'd be expecting no, the teacher this, to finish no, it. No, I'm telling you that they can, it can run on at least seven different types of fuel. And um, one of those is hemp oil or vegetable oil, as we know. Hemp is a renewable crop. 
but it's, it's not cannabis, it's the male, it's the male plant, which is not anything that will get you stoned or anything like that, but actually it's a crop that grows... Is it a full moon? Uh, Jed's in Worcester. Jed, what would you like to say? Good morning, James, Hello, and welcome Jed. back. Thank, Thank you. goodness you're here this morning. I couldn't to agree see more. The next, <laughs> the next iteration of the, uh, um, of the Tory Brexit, let's divide and try and fool people into thinking that dealing with the climate change crisis is something that we should have political difference about. Yeah, I mean, it is. I, I, you put it very well, actually, because you, you, you can step back from the fray sometimes and wonder how the hell this is controversial. But then Nick sent me a text already saying climate change has been going on for millions of years and, and uh, how, how, how it hasn't been caused by my Land Rover. And I saw people admittedly mostly on that weird television station that's got a whole heap of interesting issues facing it at the moment, but I saw people claiming that it's all a hoax, that it's not actually real, and and that gets traction, doesn't it? Slowly but surely, Donald Trump can tell complete lies about an election, it gets traction slowly but surely. So that's the first question I'd ask you. Do you think it's going to work? Well, it's not as a culture war, as a new front this, in the culture this, war. This is not going to work, and it's not going to work because I think there are people in the Tory party who, um, uh, um, uh, Chris Skidmore, for example, yes. uh, went out early in this last week and uh, asked for all party effort to deal with climate. Yes. And, and he's been directly contradicted. So I would imagine that the biggest culture war is going to be taking place in the Tory party. Well, he's I, an interesting would, character, isn't he? Because he was the, the, the author of that dreadful book, the co-author of that dreadful book, who didn't end up at the very top of government, Chris Skidmore, the, 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 whatever it was called, the Britannia Unchained book. And Lord Debon as well, John Gummer as he was, is, is very, very critical of the there. current government. They're, they're, all, they're all in there. But they're all in there for um, very much self-serving rather than serving the country um, uh, reasons. And uh, Alex couldn't have put it better. It, really, it, it was quite heartening to listen to the scientists be quite so angry with people yeah. for not picking up on the well, reality. Well, that's what reminded what me of, of, of Leonardo DiCaprio. Is the more you know yeah. about it, the more furious you're going to be, really. Exactly. So my fury, my, my fury went straight into the Green Lib Dem Twitter feed saying Rishi Sunak adds firelighters yeah. by, going, by going down this route. Um, cl clearly, as Alex has said, it's going to take the best part of a couple of decades and more to get either nuclear um, or oil and gas into the electricity grid. Mm. But, you know, um, they're so cheap that in Spain you can buy solar panels. So um, they're not in, even, it's not the even being it's, offered, it's, mad. it's not even being offered up as a substantive solution to the problem described. It is simply the, the red meat element of it that is politically, they hope, politically advantageous. It's not going That's to be. That's what they're doing. Oh. That's what they're doing because they know that whatever we say, uh, people are so broke, thanks to Trussonomics, that they can't afford to go out because they haven't got spare cash to go out and spend a few grand on solar panels, another few grand on... Um, so on so the person who comes along and tries to create the idea that you don't need to worry about it is going to be temporarily quite popular, perhaps. That's the calculation that they're going for. Jed, thank you. I, I Listen, I think he's an absolutely hideous politician in a million different ways. But Julian Suffolk reminds me, Zach Goldsmith uh, goes on, on the list of conservatives who have expressed outrage at what the Tories are doing. I, admittedly, if you accept a peerage from Boris Johnson, you don't really get to be taken seriously when you subsequently express outrage at what other Tories are doing. But in his case, it, it is sincere and it is notable. Um, I, I think that line probably is the zeitgeist, isn't it? The more you know about it, the more you understand, the angrier you'll be. It's, it, it, it's got a direct descent from Brexit. The more you understand, the angrier you'll be. Yeah, it's great. I love all the angry people because I understand nothing is the sort of John Redwood school of thought or the Nadine Dorry school of thought. And where do we go on climate change? Where do the kind of people who said Brexit would be brilliant because they were too thick to understand anything, where do they stand on climate change? It, I'll give you a clue. It's not a Venn diagram. It's a bloody circle. It's half past ten. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. 33 minutes after ten is the time. It's it, 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 Go on, have a crack at the politics of it as well now. So th th the first question is, what did you think when you heard this morning that Rishi Sunak was planning to uh, grant licences for more drilling for oil and gas? It, it, it is something of a culture war, given that I think Labour have pledged a block on all domestic new oil and gas drilling. Um, 
because they want to achieve net zero by 2030. You heard Alex, a climate scientist in a state of high, understandable high dudgeon. I, I do. I, I, I don't. I don't like being accidentally condescending. All right. If I if I if I'm going to be condescending, I want to be doing it deliberately. And and I very deliberately subscribe to the school of thought that we live in a country now where people who don't understand stuff have been promoted into positions that have consequences for everybody, for, for all of us. People who are, I mean, almost professionally stupid now in the Conservative Party. And they will all be on the anti-climate change bandwagon. But clever people, clever, deeply dangerous, cynical, clever people who either lack empathy to such a degree that they don't care about poorer parts of the world catching fire or who are sufficiently deluded to believe that the pursuit of money will eventually somehow solve all problems or even people who think they'll be okay because they're so rich even if the planet is burning they'll be the they'll be the lucky few who manage to escape on a spaceship or something like that so it, it's all out there and and also you know personal short-term ambition i listen standing up against uh, environmental campaigners is is better for my career than siding with them. You're not going to get very far on a Rupert Murdoch organ or a Rupert Murdoch uh, TV station if you are climate uh, honest. If you're honest about climate change, so you know, or, or indeed uh, on the mail. So again, career can determine. Short-term career considerations can determine it as well. Um, but but have a look at the last thing they sold you. And, and have a think about how honest their description of it was before you opened the box. You remember the cheaper food, cheap shoes for peasants? You remember the, the, the energy costs were going to come down? Remember that they needed us more than we needed them, so our trading situation wouldn't change at all. There'd be no delays at Dover. There'd be nothing like that. We'd be able to swan in and out of other countries. There'd be no changes to freedom. You remember all of that. And now, now have a little think about whether possibly it would be wise or unwise to buy another massive box off the same people without knowing what's inside. Them telling you, pointing at the shiny, glossy picture on the, on the outside. Oh, that's a wonderful new toaster. And you open it and it's a couple of Coca-Cola bottles and a folded up newspaper. 10.36 is the time. Juliet is in Quimbra in Portugal. Juliet, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. Missed your dulcet tones over how two kind, weeks. How kind you are. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, my first thought uh, when I found out what Sunak yes. was doing was horrified. Go on. Um, how immature, how cynical, um, and what are you thinking about? Oh, of course, you just want to get in again with mm. all your cronies. I li have lived in uh, central Portugal since 2015, and we had the most diabolical fire in 2017 which wiped out and obliterated people's livelihoods here. We have an olive farm, and our olive harvest was taken out. 300 oh. olive trees just burnt oh. in a matter of minutes. We couldn't get out. There was no way to get out, and we fought the fire, and we saved everything apart from the olive trees and other, and other trees. Oh, but for us, we were lucky. For other people, they lost everything absolutely everything and their lives as well and for people not to see that from you having you've been in greece recently those people who were helping british tourists as, you know get away um what's happened to them what's happening to their livelihood and i guess this is on an emotional scale that i'm talking about but this is happening everywhere in southern europe and it will go north and it's just a cynical, opportunist movement on his behalf. And it's shocking and it's outrageous. Uh, and will it work? At some level, I think it will. Do we get to keep it? I mean, is it even true on the energy security front? that we, Or, or does it just go on to the open market? You're just adding I to the it. sum total of fossil fuels that are in circulation. You do, I, I suppose. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah, I suppose if if you know if if a situation escalated or a war, like the invasion of Ukraine or something like that, then presumably you can re you get first dibs on it if it's yours. I I, I know, for example, that if when we were in the EU, you got first dibs on Norwegian um, yeah oil because we, oil. we we voted our way out of that arrangement. So there must be some argument behind the energy security argument, but the the timescales are ridiculous. So, I mean, this is quite bleak, really. 
the idea so that, that no, but no, I don't mean the obvious bleakness. I mean, I mean, you, you've highlighted the slightly less obvious bleakness, which is we're not even talking honestly about fossil fuel production and, and climate change. This is all about selling people something, another con. Here's something else to get your teeth into. Oh, you can drink those tears of the of the climate of the eco zealots or whatever you want to call them. It's just literally another wedge issue. Smash the wedge in there. And and arguably this has got more to do with trying to sow division among political opposition than it has with shoring up the Tory base, such as it is. Absolutely. And exactly what you were saying before about um, they have enough money to ride it out and they don't care about the little people wherever or whoever they are, they will be all right. And they that's will the it. bit I don't yeah. get. Well, that's why you have to persuade people it's a hoax, I suppose, isn't it? I mean, throughout history, the richest people on the planet trying to persuade some of the poorest people on the planet that they're somehow on the same side. And, of course, the best way that you do that historically is through is through racism. And there is an element of racism here because it will be you know, uh, foreigners in, in, in the parts of the world that are already the hottest that will be rendered refugees by, by flood and, and climate change and whatever it may be. So that's, that's uh, so, sort of subtle or low-level racism as opposed to just banging on about small boats all the time as a right-wing politician in the hope that people won't notice the absolute damage that you've done to the country after having 13 years with your, with your grubby little hands on the steering wheel. Juliet, thank you. Did your trip, I mean, forgive me for the stupidity of this question, but how, 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 how long does it take for the trees to grow back? Three, well, they're still growing back. They are. Some of them haven't done very well. Yes, seven, 2017, we had our first very small harvest in 2019, which was remarkable. Um, some people still haven't got theirs back. And last year was uh, a very, very good harvest. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes, I, I, I mean, you. that is uh, nature will heal. The trees will be all right in the great scheme of things. There just might not be anybody left to pick the olives. Thank you, Julia. It is 20 minutes to. I love olive trees. I don't. I, I, the, 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 it's illegal to cut them down, I think, in Greece. There's all sorts of rules and laws governing them, but so, they're ancient. They're like. They're, they're, Something quite... Uh, Tolkien was good on this, wasn't he? On the almost the sort of anthropomorphic nature of trees, the, the, the way that they almost have a... sometimes seem to have an almost human dimension. They're so gnarly and... and well, gnarled, actually. I'm not a surfer. They're so gnarled, olive trees. They're almost like little poems, uh, each one. Thank you, Julia. 10.41 is the time. Oliver's in Camberley. Oliver, what would you like to say? Oh, good morning. Thanks very much for having me on. You're most um, welcome. Uh, I think I'd like to maybe give a slightly different pers- perspective on the of problem. Course. I think I think it sounds like a, that you know a huge number of licenses are being issued, um, and there's going to be a massive amount of uh, drilling with the potential pollution from all the oil that's going to be produced. Um, however, maybe a little bit more context on that of. Mm. Um, those licenses that are being made, made available for people to bid on doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be taken up. It also doesn't necessarily mean that those, that those prospects are going to be drilled um, to produce oil because there might not be any economic quantities there for people to actually sure. produce. So it sounds like a big headline number, and it is a big headline number. But the issue that we've got within the oil industry in the UK at the moment is that we don't produce enough domestically to be able to satisfy our current needs Mm. we do need to reduce the amount of oil and gas that we use in this company absolutely the green agenda is definitely a very valuable agenda however we also need to look at being able to produce our own domestic oil and our own domestic gas we only produce about 75 percent of the oil that we need so if we i mean i like this the the pragmatic argument is look in an ideal world we wouldn't be using any but as long as we still are while moving towards trying not to it makes more sense to use our own than it does to use other people's there's there's a pragmatic there's a pragmatism to that but talk to me i mean surely you sell it to the highest bidder regardless of where it's come from don't you if you're in the business (laughs) Yes and no. I mean, the oil is on. <laughs> yes and no. So, so you don't necessarily send it to, sell it to the highest bidder. You sell it to the person that requires that particular type of oil because yeah. different oils have got different properties. However, what I, what I think the other thing that maybe maybe people don't also understand is you don't necessarily just drill an oil well and then in perpetuity that oil well produces the sure. same amount of oil from day one until the end of days. We've got about 3,000, just under 3,000 oil wells um, in the UK at the moment, offshore and onshore majority of them being off, offshore. Yes. Over 30% of them, nearly a 1,000 of them, are what we call shut in. So they don't actually produce any oil at all. Now, in the next decade, about 2,000 of those wells are going to also be decommissioned, abandoned is what that's called, which yes. is where 
we completely remove the infrastructure. We fill them with with cement and we re- re- fill return. them with carbon dioxide, according to Rishi Sunak's other big announcement today. But we- uh, some of them you can do that too. Some of them might not be, you know. So- viable enough for that it's like saying every single field you can plant wheat on well yes. that's not quite quite the, quite the case however the point here is that oil wells do what we call decline gas wells do it as well so you get a hundred percent on day one and then by the end of however many years depending on the size of the field and the pressure of the reservoir you might have 25 percent of the oil or even less coming out um uh, in total so you need to kind of regenerate and rejuvenate that stock of oil wells that you have what i pose to you is that yes it's a large number of licenses but the oil and gas sector in the uk is world class and world leading and we have the capability the technology and the experience and expertise within the likes of aberdeen uh, and, and 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 our, and our, our yes. industry centers to be able to produce this oil as sensitively and environmentally responsibly as is possible, rather than relying on other parts of the world, yes. where we then have to stick in a great big boat and burn a lot of oil. No, I, 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 I think I think I think that the, the pragmatism of, of what you describe is is inarguable. I, I mean, you overlook the possibility of not doing it at all. You know, no new oil and gas drilling would be, I think, the Labour Party policy. So that then exerts pressure upon other means of production, not on shipping it in from elsewhere in the world, but on sustainable... You're not going to get sustainable, top-level sustainable energy production unless you dedicate almost all of your energy to trying to create sustainable energy. So the, the flaw in your position, pragmatism aside, is that the more drilling you do, the, le- the more pressure you take off the drive towards sustainability. Unless you're not drilling at a rate that's fast they enough even, to even, replace he, he, No, I know. Well, no, because Rome wasn't built in a day. But the, but I'm talking mm. about the pressure. I'm not talking about the, the the end game. The more drilling you do, the more pressure you take off the urgency of of, of sustainable energy. I think that that's the, the the kind of never the twain shall meet point. Because you make a brilliant case for saying, well, if anyone's going to do it, it should be us. I geographically, economically, uh, technologically, your arguments are incredibly sound. But if you were coming at it from completely the other end of the telescope, you'd be saying, well, we shouldn't be doing anything because all of the money you're spending on drilling, all of the expertise that you're expending on exploration, all of this, all of that, all of that should be dedicated towards trying to increase sustainable energy production. And and that's not a yes-no argument, is it? That's just two positions that can never really meet. You're absolutely right there, and mm. and it's, it's not about being binary. Um, no, it's they about, can't. No, I get it's that. It's about having an, an an energy mix that makes the most sense. And at the moment, you know, we are still in the in, in the infancy of transitioning away from oil and gas. And because we're in the infancy, we need to make sure that we've got a really solid energy foundation that yeah. we can build on, which unfortunately at this point in time still requires us to have. Some some oil and gas production, yeah, and and yeah. if 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 we still unfortunately have that requirement, then the argument for using our own rather than shipping it in from the other side of the world is 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 strong, um, but not irresistible. Oliver, thank you. You're right. We did need a a, a, a different perspective on that. Um, so I, I, you didn't answer the original question: is what went through your mind when this was announced this morning? And I, I shall speculate that on your behalf. And it was yeah, okay. That that that, that sounds like a pretty much the best of a bad lot, if you like, or a good way of approaching something that we all wish we didn't have to approach. 10.47 is the time. 10.49 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, just looking at this, um, uh, it's slightly unfortunate for, well, Greg Hands, but but also for Rishi Sunak, in that they, the, is, is he business secretary still, Greg Hands, or is he just in charge of tweeting about Liam Burns' note in the Treasury? 13 years ago. Is that his only job now? Just every day, he says, do you remember when Liam Byrne left that note saying there wasn't any money left? Is that a job now in the Conservative government? Minister for tweeting about Liam Byrne? Is that... I don't know. Anyway, he made it. He did some myth busters. Uh, I, I can even give you the date. It was the 3rd of February, 2022. Rishi Sunak has said today that we have, or is due to say today, uh, that we have to drill for new gas in the UK in order to make energy more affordable for consumers. Okay, more affordable. What, in your words, what does more affordable mean? Cheaper. Cheaper, yeah? It means cheaper, right? I cannot, yeah. Rishi Sunak says we have to drill for new gas in the UK in order to make energy <clears throat> more affordable 
or cheaper for consumers. Now, his own... Is he business? I can't remember. Anyway, this bloke, Greg Hands, uh, he did a myth buster on the 3rd of February 2022. It even had Her Majesty's government insignia on it. You know, a little kind of coat of arms in the top left-hand corner of the tweet. What do you call them if it's not Twitter anymore? That's one for mystery. I'm not calling it X's. That sounds ridiculous. Also, I'm a journalist. X's are about trying to get money off the boss to pay for last night's dinner. Um, the myth is extracting more North Sea gas lowers prices. The fact is, and this has got Her Majesty's government logo on it, we are committed to North Sea gas production for security of supply. However, UK production isn't large enough to materially impact the global price of gas. So Rishi Sunak's lying to you today. Problem is, and this is the calculation, some people like being lied to. And you can see why. Uh, you know, if, if you could shave a few points off your IQ, you would probably love the idea of not having to worry about the climate, wouldn't you? Someone comes along and says, oh, don't worry about that. It's all a hoax. It's all a hoax. It's all made up. It's all, it's all, something, it's all to do with the World Wildlife Fund. Not the World, the World Economic Forum. They're all, they're, we're, 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 who's, it's all down to George Soros. It's here, well, 15 minute cities. Yeah. You know that kind of person? Someone comes along and says, oh, don't worry about the old climate. It's all a hoax. If you could just halve your IQ, you'd love that. You'd, you'd lap it up. So some people like being lied to. And along comes Rishi Sunak to tell them he's going to make energy cheaper. And just ignore that Greg Hands bloke who is business secretary or was until... Why has no one texted me? He's party chairman. Thank you. I'll just have to... Party chairman, Greg Hands. Chairman of the Conservative Party says it definitely won't make energy any cheaper. Leader of the Conservative Party says, yes, it will. Who, who are you going to believe? Oh, I don't know. Uh, God, 10.52. Kenny's in full cut. Kenny, what would you like to say? Yeah, James, I'm absolutely raging what? at this, these lies. Go on. I'm, 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 I'm so sick of this energy security lies that, that, that get spouted. It's disgusting that, 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 that even the press regurgitate it. Yeah. It's, a, it's the biggest, fattest lie that's ever been told. How do you know? You know, I, 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 live, in, I live in Falkirk. I live right in the, right in the door of yeah. the Scotland's refinery where we make, we make diesel, petrol, kerosene and all the yes. base products from North Sea oil. But the vast majority of it actually gets shipped abroad from mm. Hound Point and um, Flotter, and um, I used to work up in Shetland in the, uh, on a gas plant right next door to Sillam Ho, where all the oil and gas it all, all gets shipped abroad. Like, 80% of this energy security gets shipped abroad. It's the biggest, fattest lie. It's disgusting. And, you know, they're talking about making it more um, affordable for people in the UK. That is also the biggest, fattest lie ever for feeding oligarchs' bank accounts. It's the biggest... Swag bag ever done to the um, English and Scottish assets uh, shipped abroad? So, well, isn't that to do with what's needed for certain sectors? So, you, you, you know, the, 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 we we think, oh, or at least he, what he, he wants us to think, uh, oh, that's good. My energy bill will come down. But in fact, the stuff that they're sucking out of the North Sea is is is, is not going to be used for domestic heating or anything like that. It's going to be used for something else, and they'll they'll sell it. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, so even mean, the security I, I, side. So the idea that it's going to make our our bills come down is a lie. I think we can call it a lie, well, can we? Take because I mean, Greg yeah. Hands has told us he's the party chairman. It, it, yeah, it, it, massive it's a, lie. So that's a massive lie. Know. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of the the chairman of the Conservative Party called it a myth, and Rishi Sunak today calls it a policy. So there, there you go. That's your modern Tory party in a nutshell. The energy security line, which is quite compelling because of what's happened in Ukraine recently. You're telling me that's yeah, also uh, a straight lie. Oh, oh, geez, on, honest to God, I had, a, I had a heating bill during the winter for six hundred quid. I've yeah. got a friend. I've got a friend that, that she can tell you that it costs her something like two pound thirty an hour to run an electric heater during the winter. So mm. she chooses she to only run it a certain amount of time. You know, it's it's it's, it's, it's a disgusting lie. It's a disgusting lie. Meanwhile, I'm sitting and I can see the lights. The local refinery is lit up like New York. Mm. They, they're no. Jim Ratcliffe isn't worried about his energy bill eh, from what he gets from the North Sea, but he exports 80% of it. It's, 
Uh, no, know, okay, that's you know, important. Like, Again, know. facts, facts, facts. You know, not that long ago, I'd have thought, oh, come off it, Kenny. You must have got your facts a bit wrong on this one. This is this fella's a prime minister. He can't be blowing smoke up over his backside on this this sort of scale. There must be some truth in it. There must be some, but I don't. I'm afraid I don't subscribe to that school of thought anymore. I don't think I've become more cynical or more sceptical. I think I've become more realistic. They will lie to you. They have lied to you. They made Boris Johnson prime minister. I'll say that again because, I, I, I mean, what more evidence do you need? They made Boris Johnson prime minister, a man who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him round the face with an arbroath smoky. It's 10.56. Matt's in Guildford. Matt, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. Um, I'd just like to join Oliver in trying to add a bit of perspective from some of the potential positives of the oil and gas industry. I know there's been a lot of voices this morning um, speaking against it, quite rightly from a climate perspective. And I have to say, most, most of the people that I work with in the industry are very, very aware of the climate crisis, but mm. also they understand from a pragmatic point of view the need for responsible oil, oil and gas in the UK. Um, there's a couple of points that I wanted to make, really. One was there was a point made at the very beginning um, of the session today about CCS not working. This, it's not available. That's carbon capture and storage. Um, that, that actually is a lie because it's currently in operation in Norway where they're currently storing a million tonnes of CO2 per year in the Northern Lights project. Yeah. Um, and our hope in the UK is to replicate some of that and be a leader in carbon capture and storage um, in the UK. We're, I think we're probably the, the, one of the best place. The, I hope you're right, obviously, up to a point. I think the research that Alex was referring to was, was looking at the feasibility of it being done in, the, in, 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 in our fields, as it were, as opposed to saying it couldn't happen happen anywhere in the world it was more the question of w- w- will it work in the way that rishi sunak is announcing today but listen you'd have to be daft not to want you to be at least half right on that what was the second point because i'm just conscious of the time and i want to ask you at least one question yeah absolutely um uh, it's also worth noting that the oil and gas industry currently supports over two hundred thousand jobs in the uk that's yeah. a hell of a lot of jobs that yes, again is. This is going to help. And, and entire economies, situation. particularly, actually, in Kenny's part of the world, there are entire economies built on the, the oil and gas um, uh, up in Scotland and, and elsewhere. But, the, the, but that, that takes me back. The other point I made to Oliver is the same one that I make to you, is that those jobs could just as easily be working in the field of in, enhancing and improving sustainability. But, but, but the question I wanted to ask you is just address that twin point about it's not going to bring down the cost of British energy bills, is it? And, and it doesn't really add to our energy security either because the kind of stuff we're pulling out of the North Sea isn't the kind of stuff that we need to heat our homes. Well, on the second point, yeah. um, actually quite the contrary. Oh, because good. In, in, in the UK, we have it's separated between Scotland and England. And in England, the vast majority of what is produced is gas. And we have pipelines that lead from the UK, uh, from the English gas fields, straight onshore to places such as Thorpe, yeah. Acton. Um, that gas pretty much Acton? goes straight into the grid. Yes, but... Back, not Acton, back. To oh, I was going to say, flipping out. <laughs> that sounds dangerous. And and that pretty much goes straight into the grid. So in terms of cool. security, well, that's good to know. So gas, that helps. That 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 is right. But it won't bring um, down in prices. Terms of, in terms of the oil question, it's quite right that actually a lot of the oil gets shipped to Europe because that's where a vast number of the refineries are. Because we haven't got the any industry, we haven't got any industry anymore, so exactly. we've got no use for the oil. Exactly, <laughs> but we get it back, we, we do get it back from Europe, and the yeah. preference really is, would you rather be getting it back from Europe, or would you rather be getting it from Saudi Arabia with all of the questions around civil rights, etc., and also the increased carbon cost of shipping it all the way from um, countries... You make, you make a strong so, case, and you've brought it in almost on time. It's very, very unfair of me, as you head for the for the exit to point out that the moral arguments about not wanting to rely on Saudi Arabia not for you Matt but for the Conservative Party tend to go out of the window when we're talking about flogging them cattle prods and sundry other potential instruments of torture. Oh yeah you've got to watch those Saudis when it comes to buy gear. We want to get our own oil. Oh by the way would you like to buy some bombs so that you can drop them on Yemen? I'm just pointing out there is some moral uh, ambiguity about some of these energy security claims, let alone um, actual ethical ambiguity. It's, it's, it's gone 11, actually, already. What do you want to do? Should we do low traffic neighbourhood? Are you feeling it at all? I mean, you know, you can, we can rely on each other, can't we? We can make boring radio brilliant on this programme, can't we? OK, this is a bit weird, because it will sound 
quite odd for a radio phone-in host to complain that the government has turned into a radio phone-in programme. But this is no ordinary radio phone-in programme, as you know. This is not the kind of place where you can just sort of wang on about immigration all the time, be economical with the truth about everything from Brexit to Boris Johnson, or indeed dedicate several hours to conversations about bollards. I actually love bollards. I've been offered the life presidency of the World Bollard Association on several occasions, but I feel that at the age of 51, I'm not yet ready for the challenge. But I don't think that traffic calming measures or indeed parking tickets, lend themselves to scintillating radio-based conversations. And I do have the receipts to prove it. (laughs) However, there's something quite unnerving about watching a government reach for supposed policies that could have come straight from the mouth of a caller to LBC in about 1978. And and that that is a worry. So barges for immigrants. I mean, look, look me in the eye and tell me that wouldn't have gone viral. 15 years ago. There's a bloke on LBC says we should build a massive barge and stick them all in Portsmouth Harbour. It's like, you know, the one who said we should go after the dinghies with Stanley knives or something like that. And now it's policy. Now it's actual policy. I was writing this week about when Nick Griffin went on Question Time and how everyone clutched their pearls and it was quite a, a fascinating time. Now, you know, and now Farage has got a season ticket. The way the world turns, it's just quite dispiriting and and now we are living in a country where slightly unhinged callers to radio stations in 1978 are writing government policy Uh, you you know whether it's someone like david frost you know the nick timothy do you remember him he's the one that decided it'd be a brilliant idea for theresa may to have a general election in 2017 he now writes columns for the daily telegraph that sort of have headlines like uh why woke children are actually curly whirlies that is stuff like that they've, they've selected him to fight matt hancock's old seat in, a, in an election tories i mean imagine looking at him and thinking oh there's the fellow that's just the fellow we need that's the, that's the fellow we need the bloke who writes mad collins for the daily telegraph after being an absolutely disastrous special advisor to theresa may didn't he come up with the go home vans when he was at the home office as well that's it you see there's a go home van that is a caller to lbc in 1978 And they've stuck it anyway. So low traffic neighbourhoods. You could have opened up the phone lines on this programme in 1978. It's, oh, what do you think about efforts to make you stop using your car so much? I think it's absolutely outrageous, James. An Englishman's home, an Englishman's car is his castle. (coughs) Love to the family. You could could go mad on this stuff. But that's what the government are doing. That's that's what the government are doing. That's That's where they are. And it means that there are front page stories today. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. The front page news today. Leading the bulletins today. Woke up this morning, turned on the radio. There it was. A top story. Top story in Brexit Britain. The uh, Prime Minister is going to have a look at low traffic neighbourhoods. Something, something. Plant pots, plant plots, something, something. CCTV. Uh, front page of the Guardian. Ministers seek curbs on 20 mile per hour limits in push to woo motorists. So uh, the, the mindset that gives you um, uh, parking tickets are the root of all evil and all the rest of it is now in the heart of government. Desperate, desperate, so desperate are they to find something to hang an electoral campaign on the, after the success in Uxbridge. Did I tell you, you know my mate Scott, who lives in Uxbridge, the t-shirt king of Uxbridge. If you have a, all, your, all your branding, merchandising needs, get yourself over to Balcony Shirts. And he told me, he, te- he texted me on holiday to say, I think they're going to win. And he said, have a look at the odds. It was about 20 to 1 at the time. Actually, I'll find you the message. I, I wouldn't want you to think that I was being uh, uh, economical with the actuality on this one. He said, he, said, he said, everyone I speak to is just talking about you, Les. He says, the bookies have got it wrong. The journalists have got it wrong. He said, everybody's got it wrong. And it, he was right, wasn't he? Only 495 votes in it. But if you had a few quid on that, you would be absolutely laughing. Um, I'll find you the message in a minute because I can't remember what odds he got. The point being, of course, that that has prompted something of a rush of blood to the head on the part of uh, the Conservative Party. They think, because you, Les, despite the fact, as far as I can tell, it was um, Boris Johnson's original idea, and oh, he got it at 11s. Uh, ten, no, he got it at 10s, 10 to 1. So you stuck 100 quid on that at 10 to 1. You'd be laughing, wouldn't you? 
And and that's that's when he told me it was ten to one. I think it had been out further than that at some point. And he said they're going to lose. I promise you, they're going to lose. And they did. And that's where the ULES thing comes in. So four hundred and ninety-five votes. If all the green votes had voted for uh, the Labour Party, the Labour Party, I think would have won in Oxbridge, wouldn't it? Did, that, what happened to that other fella, the one, the one, uh, Lewis that wasn't Lewis? How did he get on? I was on holiday at the time. Did he did he lose his deposit again? The bloke from Lewis who wasn't Lewis. Did he, he ran in Duxbridge, didn't he? Duxbridge and Rice? Well, someone will text me in a minute. The, um, the point I'm making is the desperation that is in place here. We are the party of the motorist. You sort of think, who's the party of the pedestrian? I use the bus every day. Who, who speaks for me? But they're going after so-called low-traffic neighbourhoods. You probably need to know what the numbers are like on the 20-mile-an-hour thing. They're, they're pretty striking. I, I know this because I used to be a bit obsessed with uh, four-by-fours. One of my many failed campaigns in life was to try and resist the rise of the so-called Chelsea tractor, the, the, the four by four, um, uh, so popular. I got absolutely nowhere with that. It's like the time I tried to boycott the pick and mix counter at Woolworths. But if a pedestrian is hit by a vehicle at 20 miles per hour, there's a 2.5% chance that they'll die. If a pedestrian is hit by a vehicle at 30 miles per hour, there's a 20% chance that they'll die which is one of the reasons why councils are looking at introducing 20 mile per hour speed limits. But Rishi Sunak thinks there are votes in uh, restricting councils' ability to impose 20 mile per hour uh, speed limits. It's described as part of a shift, a new shift against green policies and traffic schemes, a stance condemned by safety and travel groups as short-sighted and divisive. So there's two stories here. There's the 20 mile per hour limit, but there's also the low traffic neighbourhoods. There is, I, how long do I usually get away with prefacing an observation by saying, when you're on holiday, I do it every year, don't I? It's like, well, the thing is, when you have a couple of years off, you, get your, you, you step back from the fray a bit. And then you come back, you notice things differently. Do you know what I mean? You notice things differently. Your own house can look different. Actually, ours did, because we had some building work done while we were away. But that, that's a slightly different proposition. You, you, things look different. You do, you do a double take. It's a bit like the frog boiling analogy. You, you, when you go away for a couple of weeks, you come back, or if you don't see the grandchildren, your mum always goes, God, you've grown, and you think they haven't grown at all. They're the same size they were yesterday. And then you remember that she hasn't seen them for a month or for two months or for more. So, the, so you come back from your holiday, and you sort of think, that's not right. That's not normal. I only had two weeks off. I, 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 I barely, barely dabbled in current affairs back home. I couldn't take my eye off the ball completely, but I barely dabbled. And you come back and you think, that can't be, how's that? And then, was it last night or this morning? Anyway, I put the news on. And the top story, the Prime Minister's going to have a look at low traffic neighbourhoods. And I just thought to myself, well, there's quite a lot going on. There's quite a lot going on. Why? Why is the Prime Minister having a look at low traffic? Now, then I remember my friend Scott and his uncanny prediction that the Tories would win in Oxbridge because everybody, because the ULES thing had landed. Terrible manipulation, really, by the media. The, the, the idea that but it was Boris Johnson's idea. And I think, didn't Grant Shapps insist upon the expansion in order to allow Sadiq Khan to get some of the money that London needed, that TfL needed during the lockdown? I, I may have got that slightly wrong. but And also... You know, the massive, massive, massive majority of cars are already compliant, but it just somehow managed to upset people. It got it got under the skin of that particular constituency to the point where they did considerably worse than they had done previously, but a hell of a lot better than people were expecting. And so what they've done, they've thought, well, that works then. We get on this sort of... We tell them some fibs about a combination of cars and the, and the environment, and this can be electoral electoral jackpot territory for us so they've gone after low traffic neighbors have a look around go on have a look at uh, energy bills start coming down now i think but uh, interest rates have a look at your mortgage rate have a look at your rent have a look at your go down the supermarket and and just have a look at the shelves so there's i mean it used to be full right speak to someone who, who is in the business of getting food or or produce in and out of this country go, just go, just go there get, talk to somebody about what it's like trying to get staff at the moment. If you're in hospitality, if you're in hospitality trying to buy food, paying more than the soup, just have a look at, just go and talk to someone about what the world is like at the moment. And then say to them, say to them, what do you think the Prime Minister is uh, is concentrating on today? What do you think the big news is in Britain at the moment? It's, it's low traffic neighbourhoods, James. Pardon? 
You know, during lockdown, when councils started putting up big plant pots at the bottom of roads so that people wouldn't be bombing around at 100 miles an hour and cutting through here and going up there and just trying to slow everybody down and have some streets where children perhaps could play. Like they see, that's what they should do. They should UKIPify it. They should turn it into rose tinted retrospection rather than making it all sound so modern. So, what's a low traffic neighborhood? Oh, we want to go back to the days where children could play football in the street. Well, th that's actually how it works. A friend of ours has got a whopping great plant pot at the bottom of their road, and, and the kids now play football in the street. Um, why is he concentrating on this? Question number one, 0345 6060973. I've been away for a fortnight. I've come back to a country that is in economic turmoil, that has 100 million problems, and a prime minister who thinks that traffic calming measures are the biggest priority that he faces on this particular Monday morning. Why? 0345 6060973 is the number that you need. That is my desperate attempt to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That is my desperate attempt to mitigate the boringness of this topic. Okay, so that there is your grown-up political inquiry. Why, in a country that has got a uh, hundred problems, is the Prime Minister using a Sunday announcement, like dominating the news agenda on a Sunday moving into Monday to talk about traffic calming measures that have been introduced by councils. I'm not even sure he has the power to do anything about it from Westminster. So, I mean, a bit like the North Sea gas announcements being made today, it's not even politics for the real world. It's politics for the comment section of the Daily Express or 1978 LBC phone-ins. But, but it might work. That's the, that's there, the votes he's pursuing. So why, in a country with all the problems that Great Britain has got at the moment, that the United Kingdom has got at the moment, why is the Prime Minister prioritising traffic calming measures? 0345 6060973. Don't all ring in and say, because he thinks it gets... I mean, be a bit clever about it. I mean, the, you know, tell me something I don't know. 0345 And then the second question is, it's about the politics of the car, really. And this is something that I have never grasped. It's why I take the mickey out of the phone. And I shouldn't, really, because you might find parking tickets fascinating or smart motorways or um, low-traffic neighbours. Lots of people find them. Of course, some people spend so much time in their car that car-related issues are by far the most interesting things in their lives. And we should probably feel sorry for those people rather than mock them mercilessly. But I'd, I've never got the politics of the car. I did that funny voice a moment ago. I said, an Englishman's car is his castle. But it's true, isn't it? We all become a bit weird in a car. I'm not a big driver. You've probably picked up on that over the years but i do recognize the weird sense of, of of it's almost solipsistic sense that you get when you get behind the wheel of your car as if as if you you know as if you're a, a medieval knight straddling your trusty steed and battering all comers with your with, with, with you can't you cannot cross me when i'm in my car it's why people do road rage people who wouldn't say boo to a goose when they're not in their car suddenly turn into you know the Incredible Hulk, when they are in their car. It's like the politics of the car. That's what he's doing. He's essentially trying to argue that... He's essentially trying to argue or trying to, trying to provoke politics that says car drivers should be able to do whatever there it is. I knew I'd get there in the end. Car drivers should be able to do whatever they want and everyone else can get lost. And what is so weird about that is that no one is in their car all the time. Every car driver is also a pedestrian. Uh, or, or every cyclist is also a car... Almost every cyclist is also a car driver. It's so weird politically to prioritise the motor... For him to say we're on the side of the motorist, because every motorist is also a pedestrian. Every Almost every cyclist is also a motorist. Most motorists will use public transport. How can you prioritise the motorist? Unless you live in your car, unless you're the only person. The only mode of transport you use is a car. What does it mean to be on the side of the motorist? That's the question I've got. Now, have a little think. I'll ask it again in 
four and a half seconds time. Two, three, four. What does it mean to say that you are on the side of the motorist? And you can answer that however you want. However you want. What does it mean? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. So why is Rishi Sunak in a country with all the problems this country currently faces, prioritizing traffic calming measures? But secondly, you say you're on the side of the motorist. What does that actually mean? I guess I hope I'm wrong. Because if I'm not, it's gonna be a very boring subject, this. I'm not sure it means anything. Does it? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. 21 minutes after 11. Has she resigned? I should have checked. I would have just, did I mention I've been on holiday? Has she resigned yet? Has she gone yet? Or do we have to? Can we do Dory's Watch today? I, I don't know if you were listening before my break, but we were keeping track of Dory's, Nadine Dory's promise to resign, and I quote, with immediate effect. I, I think she's overtaken Liz Truss now. I think now more days have passed between Nadine Dory's promising to resign with immediate ref- effect and Nadine Dory's resigning. More days have passed than Liz Truss spent as Prime Minister. Let's reflect on that for a moment. That's incredible. Have we, have you, I presume that while I've been away, you have commissioned some state-of-the-art, absolutely brilliant production. Have we got a, a new Dory's Watch jingle? We've got that what? So you're still just playing an old jingle with me talking over the top. Do you know this is the most popular show on the station? I, I, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure I should be getting a higher standard of service, mind you. I don't want to be all Billy Big Bananas. But, I, I, you know, but Andrew Marr gets what he wants, doesn't he? Andrew Marr wants a new flipping jingle. He gets a new flipping jingle, doesn't he? Andrew Marr, Andrew Marr, something like that. I just want I just want a Dory's Watch jingle. I've been away for two, you've had two weeks to get me a Dory's Watch jingle. You've got me nothing. I'm going to have to do some sums as well, because I can't remember... <sighs> It's a brilliant letter. Well, I'll save it for Dory's Watch. And I think we might resurrect Woke Watch today as well. Am I desperately trying to avoid actually having a phone in about low traffic neighbourhoods by wittering on about almost anything? Absolutely not. Lee's in East Dulwich. Lee, what would you like to say? Uh, morning, James. Hello, Lee. Um, yeah, my, my sort of... This is a kind of a, a long-held opinion I've, I've got on this, which is, which is really about the way that the, the right works and, and, and what it's trying to do. And I think there's... They've got him. They got him. They got to him. Did you hear that? He was about to reveal the secret of how the right wing works. And the phone line went, that, that's not a coincidence. That's GCHQ. Can we make sure he's all right and get him back on? Jack's in Welshpool in North Wales. Jack, what would you like to say? Hi, James. I adore the show. Thank um, you. That's really, more really like do. it. That's what we want. Adore. <laughs> we've, we've, been, we've gone up from love. When I went on holiday, people loved the show. Now they adore it. Carry on, Jack. I adore you, mate. Well, what have you got? <laughs> um, well, I've, the only theory I've got as to why Rishi Sunak is going up against LTN's 20 mile per hour speed limit is because the majority of people that complained about <laughs> things on them. Um, on the on Facebook and Twitter, yes. well, not Twitter anymore, X nowadays, mm. isn't about Brexit. They don't talk about Brexit anymore because they don't no. want to admit how much of a failure it was. True, and they don't talk about the sh- the food shortages. They don't talk about the um, the, the, the cost of living crisis. No, they talk about the Joe Stop Oil protesters um, yes. blocking the roads. Yes, and they stop about them. It's about the local council trying to stop them from going to work in their cars and so on, and being forced to go on bicycles or use the bus. So it is, is for, for the for the for the moaning class. This is now top banana. Yes, absolutely. So and he's Rich just jumping on it. That. Yeah, Rishi Sunak is looking at that and going, oh, that's a big majority of people I could get on board. I, it's, a, it's, an easy, it's an easy winner. So but that's culture that's war. That's culture war in a nutshell, isn't it? Is you, just, uh, you, you find out what people are angry about and try and get in front of them, pretend you're leading. Exactly. Which exactly. way are they running in? I mean, at the end of the day, like, I don't think he even drives his own car. He's got a chauffeur driving car, for God's sake. But he's got a helicopter, mate. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't, guess, doesn't mess about in cars. He's got a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, fair point, fair point. I forgot about that. And a private jet. That's prob- um, I don't think he's got a private jet, but he could probably afford one. Um, will it work? I mean, because you never know, do you, how representative the, the, these people are. And I don't know anyone who would bring up the subject of a low-traffic neighbourhood socially, but equally, I don't know what would happen if I did. Do you see what I mean? If I said, oh, what do we think yeah. about that? Because I, I mean... I mean 
I've been oh, caught. Like, I mean, with me, like, yes. I'm just like, because it's like, I'm living in North Wales, I'm nowhere near any LTNs. But the thing about Wales at the moment is that the, the Welsh government are trying to introduce the 20 mile per hour speed limit to all uh, town areas and so on. And the amount of people complaining about it at this point okay. like, is, is, is very high because people are like, it's like a lot of people are using the argument of it doesn't matter if you hit a kid at 20 mile an hour or 30 mile an hour, they're most likely going to be really injured mm. like, or even killed. God, that's so, brutal. Which is, it is brutal. And I think it's I think it's wrong, in my opinion, for them to say that. But also, I, I, but it works. I so it's there. Why does it work? Do you think? Is it just? Because I, I, I think the politics. I hope I'm not nicking Lee's thunder, and this is what he was going to tell us. We'll get him on after you. He's he's, he's all right. I'm glad to say. The, oh, thank God the for that. yes, exactly. <laughs> the, 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 oh, you've broken my train of thought now. How, how dare you? The the <laughs> idea that you the 20 mile an hour speed limit is it just that people like being told that they can do whatever they want even more perhaps than they like being told that other people can't do whatever they want so i am in a car i am motorist and rishi sunak is saying you can do whatever you want it's that the other lot those those protesters or those pedestrians we're going to cramp down on them so he's offering them something what is it yeah I think I think he's, it literally is that is saying you're able to do whatever you want in your car because that is like you that's your property you pay your car tax for yeah. that you pay your own insurance on that like as I said to your um, researcher like I live literally two minutes up the road as a, a five minute walk away from my supermarket but yet I still use my car to drive there because I will admit I'm a little bit lazy because yeah. I've got my car I pay for it so I might as well use it so so and you just need a nudge to to not use it and and that is exactly. what an awful lot of people have discovered I mean it's again it's geographically pertinent because if you're doing a massive shop then you need the car to get everything home whereas if you're in a big town or uh, you know, I walk past the supermarket on the way home, so I don't really need to do the big weekly shop in the way that I would have done when I lived somewhere else. Thank you, Jack. Let's get back to Lee. Lee, where were we? Hi, James. Um, th- thunder well and truly stolen, oh, I think, actually. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, th- I think the, the point I, w- I was going to make is I, th- I think what, what um, the right is, is sort of trying to do is, is say to people, there, there are people out there that are trying to stop you lead your, lead your life the way you want to lead it. Yes. Now, the, the, now those people could be p- councils p- putting in LTNs. It, it was Brexit was an example of these European bureaucrats mm. stopping you leading your life. Um, immigration is something where like, these people are coming over, stopping you leading your life the, the way that you want it. Yeah. And what Rishi Sunak is trying to do is simply to just to latch onto the idea, because it's been very powerful politically in the past. It, it's how Johnson managed to put the Red Wall together with the Blue Shires. Yeah. Because he tapped into this idea that people are trying to prevent you, lead your life the way you want it, and we will not let them do that. We are but here it, to stop people in I think I think you're right. What's weird is that it's a very odd flex for a government to take, for a Prime Minister. We've been in charge for 13 years, and we're here to stop you being bossed around by the people in charge. They, they're just desperate, though. Yeah, and well, that's they never take They never take responsibility. And, 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 and Sue, you know, Sue, you know, we had Johnson... And we had we had trust, and we had Sunak, and they've, they've given up on the idea of, of government and leadership mm. and taking the country forward. And what they have is, how can we win? How can we put together enough support, yeah. even if it's only fifty one, fifty two percent? How can we do enough to win and stay in power? And they've, and, and Sunak, you know, I think a lot of people thought, you know, what well, he's got to be better. Yeah. And I think possibly at heart he is. But he's shown that he's pre- more than happy to play to the to the worst instincts. That has surprised me. His party. That we shouldn't be surprised because he gave Braverman a job back after ten minutes in the job, didn't he? So we, we should know that he will go as low as anybody else has gone. But it still surprises me to see it happening. You sort of think, oh, he can't be comfortable doing this. But at some point, you're going to have to go. He's blooming loving it. He's loving it. Well, well, Matthew Paris wrote a, 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 good, a good editorial on, on Saturday in the Times where he said, you know, Sunak can't be comfortable doing this. He, eventually it will undo him because it's, ju- it's just not him. Did now, he? Yeah, well, I think I, mean, I disagree Paris, with Matthew like, on can... that. I'll no, dig, no, I'll dig I, it I, out. I dig it out. He's one of my favourite columnists. I'll get 100 tweets now reminding me of all the terrible things he's done in his life and written about and, and put to record, but none of us are perfect. Because I, 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 I'm often find myself or found myself thinking oh he might he must just be doing this because that bloke that linton Cro- Cro- crosby protege in downing street is telling him to or he's he's doing this and he's doing at some point you're gonna have to 
he, well, either he's going to have to admit it that he's not comfortable doing it, or we're all going to have to accept that he's supremely comfortable doing it because he's doing so much of it. If he didn't like doing it, why would he do so much of it? It doesn't look reluctant. I don't know, but I shall read that article with interest. Lee, thank you. Your thunder wasn't stolen at all. It's 11.31. Thomas Watts has your headlines. It is 11.34, and uh, I, I think by popular demand, I was I genuinely, hand on heart... I was not expecting this to still be running when I came back from holiday. Dorries! It is now 52 days since Nadine Dorries promised to resign with immediate effect. That's 52 days. That's astonishing. 52 days, she said. She would resign with immediate effect. It's now reached the point, this is an extended edition of Dorries Watch because I've been off for a fortnight. It's now reached a point where a town clerk in her constituency, Flitwick Town Council, no less, in Bedfordshire, have written to her. I don't know if you're aware of this. Do you know what they've said? Dear Ms Dorries, following a discussion at the recent meeting of Flitwick Town Council on Tuesday the 18th of July, I have been asked to write to you formally to raise the council's concerns and frustration at the continuing lack of representation for the people of Mid-Bedfordshire at Westminster. You know these monstrosities claimed that they cared about democracy, didn't they, and that they were taking back control. Anyway, this is... Flitwick Town Council. You had previously announced your intention to stand down as an MP at the next election, but then announced that you were standing down as an MP with immediate effect on the 9th of June 2023. Since then, you have not resigned. The last time you spoke in the Commons was the 7th of June 2022. You have not maintained a constituency office for a considerable time, and it's widely understood that you have not held a surgery in Flitwick since March 2020. Rather than representing constituents, the council is concerned that your focus appears to have been firmly on your television show, upcoming book, and political manoeuvres to embarrass the government for not appointing you to the House of Lords. Councillors noted that your behaviour, widely reported in the press, is not in line with the seven principles of public life set out by Lord Nolan in 1995. With an estimated population of 13,800 people, Flitwick represents the largest concentration of voters in the mid-Bedfordshire constituency. Flitwick Town Council has a long history of operating on a non-political basis with a strong ethos that our council must represent the views and needs of residents regardless of party politics. Our residents desperately need effective representation now and Flitwick Town Council calls on you to immediately vacate your seat to allow a by-election. Yours sincerely, Stephanie Stanley, town, co- town clerk. That's amazing. I mean, you know, from Little Acorns, eh? What started off as a little comical moment on the radio show has now reached Flitwick Town Council, no less. Dory's Watch now going global. Um, and just in case you're just tuning in, it is now 52 days since Nadine Dory's promised to resign with immediate effect. Dory's! Oh, that didn't work then. I was just... I swallowed a bit early. Let's just quit it again. Dorries! Watch. Back to low traffic neighbourhoods. Don't, don't worry if you're just tuning in, it is me. But it's not like a normal low traffic neighbourhoods phone in. It's much cleverer than that. Yeah. David's in Luton. David, what do you reckon? Hi, how are you doing, James? Nice to speak to you. Likewise. What's on your mind? What have you got? I don't want to take the wind out of cells there a little bit, but it is flitic. No more than Chiswick is Chiswick. Flitic. So, uh, Flitic, yeah. So you're, you're in Bedfordshire as well, so you know of what I you am, speak. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. Flitic. I mean, they won't allow me. Being as I live in Luton, they won't actually let doesn't me in. Count. No, it doesn't count. No, of course not. It's not, not genteel. <laughs> Flitic as opposed to Flitwick. So I just, you could have yeah. told me sooner, mate. I just said it about oh, no, 18 I, times. You were on a roll, mate. I didn't want to, I didn't want to let it go. <laughs> you interrupt. Flitic. Flitic. Flitic sounds nicer than Flitwick. Flitwick sounds a bit Vizzy, doesn't it? A bit like sort of a made up town in Viz or something like that, or, or yeah, Flitic. Right. Flitic. Apologies, apologies to the ago, good, good people of Flitic. I, I now get a million now. I've looked at my screen now. You've mentioned it. It's pronounced Flitic. It's pronounced Flitic. Tell James it's Flitic. It's Flitic. Thank you, David. Where were we? Uh, we were talking low traffic neighbourhoods. There I believe. you go. There you go. What have you got? Well, I mean, this whole thing just. I think. I think this is something that's come from what happened in Uxbridge. I think, yes. I think the Tories have no big ideas anymore. I mean, that you know, there, there is nothing. There is nothing to give to really, really majorly hang their hats on. 
So what they can come up with is 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 a is a load of little small little things that they can chip away at. Um, you know, they're, they're starting to lose from their, their red wall seats. I yes. think they're, they're looking at those and looking at they can go and think, oh, here's a cohort we can go for here. Motorist. We're all over the country. That's six, there's 30 so odd million motor or 30 odd million yeah. cars, loads of them. So we, we, they are your enemy, that lot yeah. over there, and I am your yeah. ally. And it doesn't really have to be true because it's an emotional appeal to sort of kinship, isn't it? Of course it is. Of course it is. He didn't and even use his own car, you know, did he? When he was pre- when he was pretending to fill it up with petrol, he borrowed a car off someone round the corner. So I mean, he's so insincere, you couldn't make it up. Well, yeah. Well, well sincerity isn't uh, isn't one of their major things. Will it work? It really, will it will it will it work? Yeah, do you know what I mean? The problem is, you look at our voting system, and, and there are a number of constituencies where it doesn't take much to yeah. hang on. No, no, and it, it doesn't. And what and and. People are very, very easy swayed, as we saw with the with the ULES thing in yeah. in Uxbridge. Yeah. So it's a very, very easy thing to do, and 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 when people are, are, are they know that people are going to vote for Labour, maybe because they don't want to vote for the Tories. It, it's not a question of their Labour supporters. No, I think so you're right. You know, they're not hoovering so up you support. You don't need much to, to swing people. Just over. to swing them back again. Vote Tory, and we'll yeah. get rid of the plant pot at the bottom of that yeah. road that you used to drive yeah, down exactly. to to get the kids to school or something like that. Yeah. We just exactly. don't know. We've got no idea on the numbers, but presumably they have. Presumably they've done some number crunching. I mean, Uxbridge and Ulez was very, very specific. I mean, even though it was misrepresented and all the rest of it, that it was very specific. It was people who largely erroneously believed that they were going to have to pay. People, almost massive majority of whom would have had compliant cars, were persuaded that they didn't have compliant cars or that it was going to cost them money to, to do something where it almost certainly wasn't going to cost them money. This is a bit different. This is... I mean, James, you only have to say something once. Yeah. And th- this is the thing. Once it's said, it's out there. Turning it around, it, it, it's like the thing, uh, going back to Uxbridge again. Yeah. The whole thing about it actually being Boris Johnson's idea and and the, you know, the fact that it was it was backed up by the Tory government because yeah. of funding for, uh, for uh, London Transport. That's right. That, that was forgotten. I mean, they deliberately. Didn't make enough of it. De- deliberately yeah. forgotten. Deliberately. But Labour didn't make anything of it. That, that was thing of theirs I can't understand but as with all these things you only have to say them once start of something that becomes a narrative and flipping that narrative is very very hard yeah you're right you know, you, the amount of work you have to do changing a narrative once it's out there Oh, it's Goebbels, isn't it? He probably never said yeah. it, actually, but we always behave as if he did. The truth, a lie can be halfway around the world before the truth has got his boots on. Why Why the car, Dave? Why is the car such a, an emotive issue? What? What is this, I'm on the side of the motorist? I mean, soon as... I mean, a, a car is, apart from your house, yeah. people's car is one of their major financial outlays. That's very true. How is your car? Yeah. You look at the way people are in their cars. It's their own little domain. Yeah. They get they scream and shout at other people. The whole road rage thing. It's, it's yeah. pe- people are very emotive about their cars. And, and it's, it's very, you know, pe- people judge themselves on their cars. People judge other people on what sort of car they drive. Yeah, you're socially. right. Of course I mean, you're right. You know, the, you know the, there are people that drive around in a, in, a, in a 40 grand car that yeah. live in, in hovels. Yeah, I know there are. I always find, yeah. They live in a hovel can see the fact that they drive around in a 40 grand car. Because that's when their status is highest, when they're driving around in their 40 grand car, and, and therefore he's, he's appealing to that, something a bit others may find irrational, but if you're that person that that, um, that David's just described, it's going to be the most logical thing in the world. Funnily enough, Chris Skidmore, a Conservative MP, mentioned earlier as one of the Conservatives who would not be very pleased with the drilling announcements today, he has let his feelings be known on... on um, I'm going to call it Twitter. I'm going to be the law. I'm going to be like a Japanese soldier on a South Pacific island. It'll be a bit, it'll be 2054. I'll still be here, probably doing weekends. I'll still be here, still calling it Twitter. This is the wrong decision at precisely the wrong time when the rest of the world is experiencing record heat waves. It is on the wrong side of a future economy that will be founded on renewable and clean industries and not fossil fuels. It is on the wrong side of modern voters who will vote with their feet at the next general election for parties that protect and not threaten our environment. And it is on the wrong side of history that will not look favourably on the decision taken today. It's almost well written, this. I wonder why I didn't just 
give it another five minutes before pressing send. Worryingly, this decision has also been announced when MPs are on recess, unable to hold the government to account. I will be writing to the Speaker to call for an emergency debate as soon as we return. So a little bit of blue on blue violence this morning in response to Rishi Sunak's drilling announcements. Uh, Bruce is in Chatham. Bruce, what would you like to say? Hi, yes. Um, good morning. Hello. I am a retired police officer and I was the inspector in charge of the road safety engineering unit until about October. Just oh, gone. Gosh, OK. Are you enjoying um, your retirement? I'm absolutely loving it. Oh, that's good to hear. Good to hear. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was in charge of the unit that liaises and consults with the councils when they introduce such things as 20 mile an hour yeah. speed limits and low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, and during the COVID pandemic, it was the government that piled loads of money, central government piled loads of money yes. into Transport for London and really put the pressure and other councils on, and on other... the councils yeah. to deliver these yeah. um, and gave them really unrealistic timelines, uh, which meant that sometimes the consultation didn't take place at all, which led to emergency meetings with which TfL did get a really good grip on for us. Right. Um, for the five So you were just the Met, were you, Bruce? Yeah, I was just the Met. Okay. So, yeah, it was just concerning the Met. Okay. So the money was pumped in. They were giving unrealistic timelines. I think probably, my personal opinion, is the Mayor's office saw this as a great opportunity to put in everything he wanted to whilst everyone was tucked away in their houses. Yep. Or it could be said that they did it because the roads were quiet, but I know what I'd and put so, And some of it was clumsily done as well. So it's because of that lack of consultation, the cycle lanes that perhaps were, were, were not brilliantly thought through. Hugely so, and dangerous at times. So, you know, we would often find out about these things on a Friday afternoon at five o'clock when they were putting them in on Monday morning or over the weekend. Mm. Um, so we had nothing. We had frontline police officers coming but to us moaning that of they course. couldn't get to emergency calls, and the same with the fire brigade. Gosh. So what we've got, the problem we've got, is that what you're saying, from a perspective of uncommon experience, actually, you, you really know of what you speak, is that there is actually uh, uh, grounds for a review. Some of them that, uh, that haven't already been uh, adjusted or reversed possibly would benefit from revision. But that's not yeah. really what Rishi Sunak's doing politically, Bruce. What he's doing politically is casting himself as an enemy of them, per yes, se, absolutely. full stop. And they, they were the cause of it. They were the cause. They put the pressure. You know, the councils probably could have done it better, in, in, my, yeah, yeah. You know, in my opinion. Um, however, the pressure was on them, and it, you know they had from central government to have at the time. from central government as much as Definitely TfL. From, very much central government. Yeah. TfL were very supportive of, of us trying to get this right. Yeah, um, but central government. So they made and it, probably, and now they're trying to yeah. disown it and, and turn themselves into the enemies. Or you couldn't make it up, could you? What? No. Nope. Um, hang on, I had a clever question then. I've forgotten what it was. What? What? The the do, 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 do. no, it's gone. Sorry. Anything else you want to add? No, just that, you know, it, it was more than, you know, just inconvenience for people. They, that some of these things and the 20 mile an yeah. hour limits were, were dangerous, you know. The in, in the wrong died. place. In the, in yeah. the, so it's not, again, oh, it, he's trying to turn it into a binary good or bad, whereas you're here with the nuance. I remember what I was going to ask you. Does central government have any power to actually make meaningful change on the ground? And I know you can only speak for London, but, you know, can, can Westminster say, can Downing Street say, oh, you've got to get rid of that one? Uh, do you know, I don't know the well, final details of the, of the Seems law. Seems unlikely, bit, though. Unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, they put in 20 mile an hour limits on roads that are meant to have the look and feel of a 20 mile an hour road. It'd yeah. be like saying, try and put a 20 mile an hour limit on the M25. People yeah, just yeah, yeah. naturally can't do it. No, I hear but you. Big, I hear you. Big that, roads that, through London, they did. And it was just I didn't know. I didn't know that. I, I mean, it should really be to do with the volume of pedestrian traffic, I would have thought. I, I, that's not a an unhelpful phrase pedestrian traffic it's quite pedestrians the volume of pedestrians would determine i would have thought in large part the plausibility of a 20 mile per hour limit thank you bruce always good to have an expert on the show that makes one of us it is 11.51 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I was going to resurrect Woke Watch today because we haven't done it for so long, but I've lost the story that I, was, that I thought was... There was a, the Mail did a round-up of all the woke people yesterday and I was not in it. Blummy Emily Maitlis! He's nicking my thunder! Emily Maitlis was in it, but I wasn't. It's outrageous! I have contacted the Press Complaints Commission and demanded a recount. I, I can't believe it. How can you have a double-page spread? 
in the, the Mail on Sunday, listing all the Wokies in the country. And I didn't get a look and I didn't get a... I got absolutely outrageous. Outrageous. Uh, 11.51 is the time. Um, so, but I, I, I was going to use that for Woke Watch, but then I thought, you know, it just sounds a bit silly because I'm not in it. But the... But there was another stuff. I wonder where it is. Anyway, don't forget Woke Watch. It's coming back around again. It's all part of the culture war. I think we should get it back up and running. Hopefully Nadine Doris will resign soon and then we can get the jingle back. Otherwise, I'll just have to carry on sort of improvising. But um, what was this stuff? Was this story? Can you remember the story today? About... That's, that's very odd. Anyway, it is 11.52 and LTNs, the uh, simple question of what on earth Rishi Sunak is up to. Sam is in, how do I pronounce that? Malmesbury. Malmesbury. Malmesbury, yeah. Malmesbury. Sam, what would you like to say? Um, I'm a private hire driver, live in the Cotswolds. Um, um, Obviously, politically, it's just a vote. He's trying to win votes. Um, Whose votes? Well, the, the, you know, the, as you've already discussed with previous yeah. callers, drivers, are, you know, in the car, is it's, it's a big thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, big outlay and all that kind of stuff. But what I wanted to point out was uh, how stupid the LTNs are. Um, Go on. I was delivering a blind customer into Fulham. Yes. And uh, if I took the short route, the quickest route into to, to drop this passenger off, um, I was going to be fined £100. Um, through going through these uh, signed gateways, uh, in inverted commas. Um, if I drive the long way around, I can still get to the address. Yeah. So I create more pollution doing that. Um, so I can, yeah, you know, that, all the traffic can still go that way. You can't base your analysis on one journey. It has to be based on several thousand journeys. And the calculation will be that the pollution is decreased when thousands of people... Uh, obey the low traffic neighbourhood as opposed to you and and I understand why you mentioned that your passenger was blind but it's not relevant to the legislation you should probably be able to put a badge in your car or something like that in the way that the cameras can recognise who lives in an area and who doesn't to determine whether you can go in or not so if you, if he was in his own car he'd have been fine No I understand that but the issue is of course it puts all the traffic onto the main roads um, well, That's the best you know, place going for through it through an area and the, and, and they're all just sat there. It's just the traffic is way worse than it was pre LTN. And then hopefully they'll they'll leave the car at home next time and, and right, find a so different way they, of travelling. So my point is, if they really cared, yeah. if Sadiq Khan really cared about people's health, then why don't you pedestrianise everything within the M25? Because at the moment it seems to me that you're well, just putting a £12.50 price on these kids' Head. We're talking about you, Les, now. Well, no, you're talking about pollution, you're talking about... Politics, no, no, I'm not asking you. About... You've just moved on to you, Les, now, not low-traffic neighbourhoods. Well, no, I'm just saying... It's it, not, I'm it, not it, having it, a go. I'm just checking. That's where the <laughs> £12.50 comes in, right? So you are now talking about you, Les. You're not talking about low-traffic neighbourhoods anymore. Well, no, you... Um, it, just with, yes or no. I, I just want to make sure I haven't misunderstood you. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not smart like you, but... Well, it's not saying, a trick question. You, why have you mentioned £12.50? That's you, Les, isn't it? Uh, yes. You, right, you, so we're now talking... That's 50. fine. So we're now talking about you, Les. So, I, I, I mean, I, I've heard this a few times, and I... I <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't understand what you're saying. So you're saying he doesn't really want to make the air cleaner. He's got, he's doing something else and pretending he wants to make the air cleaner. Um, well, you don't really believe yeah. that. I, I think I, I, I... So what's he doing it for? What's the real reason why he's doing it? It's just tax. Oh, I see. So the big flaw in this plan is that if, if it works really well, he won't raise any money at all. That is true, but they'll just they'll just tax it somewhere else. It's a bit. Like oh, I saying, see. So when your argument bit, on, when your on. argument falls apart, you invent something completely new and no, spurious. It's a, bit, it's a bit like saying, right, if you buy an electric, right, this is going on to a different thing, but well, it's a bit a like saying if you buy an electric car, um, there's zero road tax on it. Now, do you think that's going to be like that in five years' time? I have no idea what you're talking about now. You're telling me that ULES is a con because it's designed to raise money. I'm pointing out the more successful it is, the less money it will make. And you've started talking about a mythical road tax. No, I think you've dragged me onto something else. No, I've followed you everywhere. Right, fine. 
pointing out the gibberish that you're talking with respect. Okay, well, I apologise for that. That's good, that's good. Uh, and you're forgiven. It's 11.56. Sam's in Bristol. Sam, what would you like to say? Uh, mate, well, I think the last caller put the nail on the head when she said uh, pedestrianise everything inside the M25. I think that's a wonderful It idea. would be wonderful, but the idea of saying he can't be sincere about wanting to reduce traffic because he hasn't no, banned it completely is... It's, 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 he's got an obligation now and he's sincere. I mean, the thing is that both drivers and non-drivers alike share the space that parking spots and roads. Well, this is what this is the politics share, of it. Yeah. Yeah, that every and driver is a pedestrian, even if they're only well, walking the from the flipping is, car to the house. They're a pedestrian. The, the, the two issues we've got that kind of will always crop up here, and I think they're a narrative that, as much as one called earlier, said they're hard to change. A narrative that has to be changed first is one that drivers are higher up in a kind of yeah transport hierarchy than anyone else. And um, two, that people are so protective of their cars, you kind of NRA style, don't take our cars off. That's a I'm really a good about. parallel. That That is a um, really, really good parallel. Because I, I we do can... wonder if they're trying to find the thing that they can get course they are. people that angry about. Cool. Yeah, you know, but they'd love it, wouldn't they? they I mean, the, 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 the gibberish. The, the, it's not a great phone line, Sam, and I'm talking over you as well, which is making it even worse. But that idea of here is something they're trying to take away from you. You will have to claw it out of my cold, dead hand. That's how poor old Sam, the previous Sam, female Sam, not male Sam, ends up saying, oh, it's not even about cleaning the air. It's about taxes, which is, you know, it stands up on Auntie Doris's Facebook page, but you shine a tiny bit of sunlight on a ludicrous claim like that, it falls apart like a cheap suit. But by that time, you've already voted. You've already voted. Sam, thank you. I'm cracking on because of the phone line. No other reason. I will sh- I squeeze in one more call. Victoria's in Woodgreen. You've only got a minute, Victoria. What would you like to say? Hi. So I live in Haringey. I'm an active campaigner against our um, LTNs largely because they've been put in with almost no consultation. Mm. So I think that's the kind of wedge that Rishi is able to get into because a council like Haringey, that's been Labour for 60-plus years, thinks that because they have such an overwhelming majority, they can do whatever they like. On one of those LTNs, 75% of residents who have lived with it for a year are against it. The residents in it? Yep, the residents in it and around it. No, hang on, I, I don't want in it and around it, I want the ones in it. Well, I can only quote you the numbers that the council have given me, and that is in it and around it. So I live 350 feet away from it. But this is how I don't think you heard the top of the show, where I said the point about them is everybody in them generally likes them, and everybody just outside them hates them hates their guts. No, but a lot of the people who have um, given feedback against them are in those. A hundred percent of the businesses that are in those LPNs. Yeah, that's true. I buy that. No, because they've got fewer. They, they think they've got fewer customers. They probably have yeah, got they fewer absolutely customers. Have. They absolutely have. Um, a number of the women who live in those LTNs who are personal friends yep. are concerned about their safety at night because they are much more deserted than they were. And your point about children being able to play in um, the road, that may be true in certain LTNs. But if you look at the ones in Haringey, what they've done is you can drive to your house, but you can't then drive through the roads. Yes. The kids still can't play in that street. And we've got well, there's, few, there's, of there's, 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 there's fewer cars. No, I hear all of that, and all of your objections are valid. I'm, I'm only keeping an eye on the time, which is why I'm, I'm speeding things up a bit. The problem here, politically, is that do you think Rishi Sunak is speaking for you? No, I don't, and I don't think that the moniker motorist is that fair at all. I agree no. with what you said earlier about people doing multiple things, especially in London. And there's a huge, there's a huge car. argument. Bruce, Bruce was in charge of this. He was the Met Police's man in charge of implementing this. He retired in October. I don't know if you heard his call, but he um, it, we're pointing out there will be decent grounds for review in lots of cases. There can be improvements and tweaks and complete reversals and revisions, but that's not what he's offering. He's essentially saying, down with them all, I'm your man. But he's offering something that no one else is. We've done deputations, we've done petitions, but he can't deliver we've done it. consultations, we've done all of that. Nobody else is. Listening. I don't think he's got the power to deliver it. <laughs> well, I hope somebody has because well, they are I destroying think he's people's lives. I th- well, okay, I, and that's—I mean, w- w- with the greatest of respect—and I hope this doesn't come out wrong. That's why I don't do it as a phone-in because there'll be someone just as passionate on the other side, and never the twain shall meet. And and. Um, I, I just end up feeling a bit left out. It's one minute after 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Oh, four minutes after 12. Uh, I'm going to play a little clip. I never get to interview prime ministers. Maybe I will if, if um, the general election goes the other way at the next. When's the last time I interviewed a prime minister? Who was it? I don't think I've ever interviewed. I think I interviewed Gordon Brown. I think I did. 
Um, so I have to listen to other people doing the interviews. Rishi Sunak's been in Scotland this morning. I just thought that this was worth having a listen to because it's that notion of him being quite petulant and thin-skinned coming to the surface once again. Uh, and then we'll crack on with a slightly unexpected conversation about a subject that we've never covered before. If that doesn't get your juices flowing, frankly, I don't know what will. But he, he's on BB, he was on BBC Scotland this morning, and I think the chap interviewing him is Martin Geisler. And I just, I just, we've been keeping an eye on that. Um, we can't launch another watch. We can't have a, a Rishi watch, thin skin watch. But at that petulance, you know, somebody said it was Beth Rigby, wasn't it? It was a brilliant question, I felt, when she said to him after, I can't remember what it was after, but she said, you've never really lost in your life, have you? It's just a, a, a glide, a glide through life. Not suggesting he didn't work hard or, or that he hasn't had... Uh, difficulties and, 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 and obstacles to overcome but that notion of really just having it easy and, and how, the real test of a person comes when times are tough doesn't it and how do you cope with adversity or even just with mild irritation yeah, Listen I am, I am being shouted at now to let you go because our time frustratingly has run out hopefully we'll get a chance to speak to you at greater length at some point in, in the near future to really get into some of these subjects let me, let me just ask you finally before you go how are you getting up here to make this green announcement today private jet? Uh, I'll, I'll be flying as I as I normally would, and that is the most efficient use of my time. But again, I think actually that question brings to life a, a great debate here. If you or others think that the answer to climate change is getting people to ban everything that they're doing to no, stop people do flying, say, to stop people do, going, though, to stop people point. going on holiday, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely the wrong approach. Right, that's absolutely the wrong approach. I, I, I mean, every prime minister before me has also used planes to travel around the United Kingdom because it's an efficient use of time for the person running the country so I can keep focusing on delivering for people. But if your approach to climate change is to say no one should go on holiday, no one should take no, on a plane, a I think you, a I think you are completely aircraft, and I'm utterly wrong. Am I? Right? That is absolutely not the approach to tackling climate there's change. There's a difference between and actually what we, are doing, what, we are doing, what we are doing is, is investing in sustainable aviation fuel as one of the new technologies like car carbon capture and storage will, will, will help us make the transition. It's not about banning flying. It's about investing in new technologies like sustainable aviation fuel that will make flying more sustainable. That's the right approach to this. But I look forward to having okay. that conversation with you again. Well, Thanks listen, very much you, for having will me. You we bye have bye. to let you go. Will you commit to coming back on and speaking Thanks to us very much. longer I think, I think this is the second time I've been on your show in the short space of time I've been Prime Minister, but I'm sure I'll be there again in the future. I hope Thanks so, very Richard much. Sunak, thank you very much indeed. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, seven minutes after 12 is the time. I, uh, that was a bit poor, wasn't it? You say, w w why are you going everywhere by private jet and not catching a train? And he says, why are you trying to ban holidays? He said, mate, I, I don't know who came up with that little line there, but I don't know that it was hugely effective. Uh, seven minutes off the top. Okay, right, here's the thing. I don't know how long you've listened to this programme. But, and you'll probably find this very hard to believe, but I, and I probably go on about it too much, actually, but I used to be a bit of a, um, a bit of a wazzock. I'm sure I'm still a wazzock in many, many, many ways. But I used to do that thing where you, you pick on something you don't know much about and you just take the mickey, right? It's a very effective... Some people have built entire careers on this. You know, Meghan Markle is a good example. You just... It's just no, that's not true, actually. You don't take the mickey. They just abuse her vilely in a misogynistic and racist fashion. I never would have been that kind of character but you, you 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 pick a subject vegetarianism was a big one for me combination of uh a sort of probably as an insecurity on my part probably feeling somewhere deep inside that there is something wrong with eating meat and therefore very defensive combination of defensiveness and insecurity so i could be a right idiot about vegetarians right i'd be like oh i bet you're wearing leather shoes as if that's some sort of gotcha or zinger. And it's always insecurity and defensiveness. Some of the most professionally pugilistic people in the British media are riddled with insecurity and defensiveness. How do I know that? Because I used to be one of them. Always come out fighting vegetarians. And I was vile about obese people as well because um, uh, well, defensiveness and insecurity. I knew that I should probably be making more of an effort to look after myself. Still should, for the record. And therefore... Anybody who reminded me of how difficult it is to change your behaviour gets abuse. It's projection. It's self-loathing. So you're very, very vile to very obese people because you know that you're overweight and you kind of hate the fact that you haven't got the 
got it together enough to sort yourself. So vegetarians would get a kicking, obese people, tattoos. They used to be vile about people. My whole second book's about this, by the way. Uh, it, 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 the tattoos, I used to be, I used to think, I, don't, I can't even remember why. I worked out why. Something you learn in therapy is try to get to the bottom of things. I worked out why. I'm not going to tell you the story now. You can buy the book. Um, and indeed order the new one while you're at it. The, 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 the abuse of tattooed, tattooed people. I used to accuse you of being unprofessional and, and unattractive and all that. So, so I am conscious of the fact that as I turn my attention to the next subject, I might be flirting with similar prejudices to the ones that I've just described. And that is why I'm getting it all out there up front. I'm admitting from the beginning that if this was five years ago, ten years ago, I would now give you ten minutes of almost certainly unfair, well, probably unfair, certainly unkind abuse of life coaches. I would say something like, every life coach I've ever met should be coaching them so their own lives are like a blooming car crash, like a skip fire. What is it about people who think they're qualified to tell other people how to live their lives having absolute messes of personal existence? Do you see what it'd be quite easy to do, right? Life coaches, uh, take the mickey, don't really know what it means, feel a bit uh, defensive and insecure. So that is... Actually, I caught myself this morning having that old impulse. I, I read a headline. It said, GPs could offer workers life coaches instead of sick notes. And I caught, I caught that little impulse. You know? I'd be like, oh, come off it. Whatever next. Seriously. It's ridiculous. They just need to, I don't know, eat less and exercise more. Or pull their socks up or stop complaining. I, and I caught it. I, that little impulse. I felt it just fluttering. Fluttering it, it was in my tummy, fluttering that old impulse, that old lazy tabloid shock jock. Meh, meh. And, and I caught it in time and I thought, mate, you don't know anything about this. And the doctors probably do. It could be a, a cost saving exercise that ends up costing more, but <clears throat> it could be a complete waste of time as well. It seems unlikely to me that it's a complete waste of time. But I would like to approach it from a slightly more sensible perspective, with your help and indeed with your permission. The story is this. Doctors will be encouraged to refer people to life coaches rather than just sign them off sick under reforms designed to get more people back to work. So I just want to know what it involves. You are allowed to suggest that it's a load of old rubbish, all right? I'm going to use the word toot. I like the word toot in this context. You are allowed to argue that it's a load of old toot, but you have to do so from a position of some experience, okay? I don't, what I don't want to do is unfairly malign an entire profession, but I don't know what they do. Two and a half million people are not working because of long-term sickness. Ministers have described a huge increase in the size of the welfare state as a consequence and claim that it is blowing a hole in the public finances. It, it could see the government go over its own welfare cap of £140 billion by about £4 billion next year because long-term sickness is pushing up spending. I want to know, A, what life coaching is, what life coaches do, 0345 6060 and B, what we think of this idea. I, I, if I was long-term sick, I think I would feel a little bit patronised and probably insulted by the idea that a, a life coach could get me back to work and that a life coach would be more used to me than a doctor. But then I hope I would have the wit to say to myself, you don't know what a life coach is. You cannot rule out the possibility that a life coach may help you get back to work until you know a little bit more about what they are and what they do. Um, about 40% of people claiming universal credit are in work at the moment, which of course has prompted Labour to remind us that the Tories' strivers or skivers narrative has collapsed because of the way they've mismanaged the economy. You can't call someone a skiver when they're going out to work every day and still struggling to put food on the table. But I have noticed a rhetorical increase in the 
critique, if you like, of long-term sick people. I have noticed them just moving into the firing line. Have you noticed this? I think because the numbers are so high, it's it's almost got an element <clears throat> of the boy who cried wolf to it. Um, don't you think that the, the you know they did so well for so long on claiming that everybody who was in receipt of unemployment benefit was some sort of feckless work shy scrounger who was taking money off the state and and spending it all on flat screen televisions and tenants extra it was massive exaggeration if not lies but it worked very well uh, again like phone-ins in 1978 very easy i don't know why i've chosen 1978 i was only six i'd never heard of phone-in in my life but that you know what i mean that that that, ret ret that rhetoric that narrative that argument of lazy unemployed people that served the Tories incredibly well. You could always get a call off someone who knew someone who knew someone whose window cleaner used to be married to someone who knew someone who was signing on and going to Ibiza eight times a year. You could always find someone like that. Or someone who knew someone who knew someone whose window cleaner used to know someone whose cousin was married to someone who were who, 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 who more off the social than I did by being a merchant banker. You could always find people like that. So... <clears throat> If this is a real problem, I mean, it's a financial problem, but the question, the key question is whether or not how many of these two and a half million people could be helped back to work. And the question I have for you today is what would a life, what would a life coach do that a doctor can't? 03456060973. So hit the numbers now, you will get through. I would like you to tell me what happened when you were referred to a life coach if indeed you have been or you've sought one out of your own volition did do they change lives i want you to help me guard against my natural impulse to be a little bit dismissive and unkind in this context because i don't think that would be helpful but i also want to remind you that you have, have every right to tell us to tell the rest of us that it is a load of old toot oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three and then if you are long-term sick we're talking about you how do you respond to the idea that the government think a life coach could get you back to work could somehow reach the parts that you have been unable to reach yourself it's 17 minutes after 12 the number you need is as ever 0345 973 19 minutes after 12 is the time. GPs could offer workers life coaches instead of sick notes. Two texts, just to set things up. Um, Whoa, James, says Kasha. My life coach experience transformed my life completely. We should not underestimate the power a lack of healthy self-esteem can wield. Unlearning some very damaging thought patterns can be transformational. A good life coach will mentor, your, mentor you through this process. Um, however, another text which arrived in exactly the same minute says, I'm a CBT, so that's cogn cognitive behavioral therapy therapist, and psychological interventions can help all people. There is no evidence that life coaching has any outcomes. And there's my problem. I, I, I could see life coaching as being a form of therapy, and certainly Cash's testimony suggests that it is, but they're a qualified therapist, um, suggests pretty powerfully that it, that it isn't. And while I can see how it might improve your life, uh, certainly speaking as a huge beneficiary of therapy, I can see it might improve your life. But long term sickness seems to me or feels to me at first to be a slightly different um, proposition. 20 minutes after 12. Jenny's in Woolwich. Jenny, what would you like to say? Hi, first I'd like to say, uh, welcome back. Thank um, you. And two, you'll have to bear with me because my voice goes wonky at times. Okay. Um, I'm your weird woman from Woolwich who had a stroke. So, oh, okay. Um, How are you getting on? Yeah, yeah, not yeah, not bad. Um, it's about this whole, um, the, like, the life coach thing. I come at it from the perspective as somebody who's on long-term sick yeah. and as somebody who trained the life coach. Okay. Um, oh, gosh. Blimey. Yeah. Do, you, do you think you deserve a radio <laughs> for that? Oh, I would love a radio. I think car. I think you do. So you're 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 a trained life coach on long terms, and you're, and you're long term sick as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah go on and have one of these. Have, have Thank one you. Of these. Liotta, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you build it, they will come. I wasn't expecting that on this topic. I have uh, to say, but here you are, Jenny. I, what can you tell I have, me? I have tears. <laughs> um, but from the like from the angle of the life, um, I'm I'm like nearly sixty. 
Um, I did it as part of the idea of I like in business about a whole whole list, about pe- business and life being people led yes. instead of just like um, economic units. And when I tried life coaching, I'm like probably like you, like issues over the years, etc. I've had lots of therapy, yeah. but life coaching was absolutely a completely different perspective. Whereas therapy was unwinding about the past mm. and like dealing with every incidents that have happened, experience and the way I felt, life coaching was a way of helping me find a path forward. It was like having some a, my person on my life sidelines okay. who could show me tools, show me ways, show me methods of how I could move forward. You know, like everything else, the baggage is still there. Yeah. But it was a way of looking forward, not just looking back. Oh, I love that. Um, but I don't hear yet, and I know you're about to move on to this, how that would <clears throat> help someone on long-term sick get back to work. It it might, it won't. It depends oh. on, it depends a lot. It depends a lot on the person. Yes. And if you're on long-term sick, you've got to be very careful about what people need because coaches... There's no um, overall arching society, methodology, and standards. Not that, uh, most people are really good or trying their best. But if you're talking about people with, say, medical issues, um, life coaches shouldn't go near that. And also, But they well, won't, OK, no, I've been a bit daft, haven't I? So this is more likely to be people perhaps with anxiety or depression, do you think, or something like that that's preventing them from working? It can be. Um, it's like me, like last year I had the stroke and I had two mate accidents in which I had major back injuries. Ooh. So I'm at the moment on sick, having all the therapies yeah. and the NHS and the therapies I've been offered are marvellous. There is a place for life coaching, but it's not in your doctor's surgery. What will be the reporting back like? How will they be keeping the tabs on your progress? Mm. You might not de- be directed to the right sort of person. Um, like everybody knows that sometimes you don't find the right therapist for a while. Yes. And when people aren't regulated or may have only done a like an online webinar for like two days in a row, it's like how how are we going to define this? Now I'm lucky that I'm quite a strong, articulate person. Um, most people aren't. It's with me, it's a trust issue at the moment, presently, with the government. Um, not that something might not be good or might not be a good idea, maybe in theory, mm. but depending as well where you are in your progress, your medical progress, is whether you will be good for coaching or not. At the moment, even though I have physio, I have neuropsychology and all these other things as part of stroke and broken bones recovery, all of it is geared to back to making me a viable economic unit. Everything I go to, it's always, aren't you so looking forward to the day you can go back to work? Yes. And I'm thinking, no, I'm not. not. I'm nearly 60. I'm physically a mess. I ache all over. I'm My shattered. voice goes wonky. Yeah. You know, and, but that's all it is. And well, that's interesting. That so it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's health, health as a means to an end rather than health as an end in itself, isn't it? I mean, a lot of what you've said, Jenny, is, is, is detail rather than principle. So in principle, particularly when you think of people with mental health debt or, or, or depression, so, you know, yeah. it could actually help. But the detail that you pick up on is that it needs to be the right people in the, in the right yeah. place. And, and it's, and it's underpinned by this, notion that everybody is an economic unit rather than a yeah and also so just sticking somebody without people without proper proper qualifications i've had therapists over the years mm. but it wasn't until i've got got people with me now under the nhs like proper doctors mm. um that it's actually really worked yeah, a few people say, I hope it's not sort of G4S or one of those other suppliers. That I, I and again, you have to, at some point, you have to have a little bit of hope, a little bit of faith. Jenny, you're sounding great. I hope, I hope, I hope your recovery continues. That was incredibly helpful and, and a, a, a timely reminder, well, a necessary reminder, actually, that they're not going to be able to, a life coach isn't going to be able to <clears throat> get someone who, whose uh, long-term sickness is, is profoundly physical suddenly better you know really to turn someone who can't work into someone who can work but in these areas that have been picked up on um what what, what the work and pension secretary has said is that the 
uh, the NHS system where people can be signed off sick after a seven-minute GP appointment is suboptimal. And he has a point. So what he wants to see is you get a kind of fit note, as it were. Right, you're off for two weeks or you're off for four weeks. And let's now look at something different. Go over to there, to these life coaches, um, and, and see what they can do. So it's a combined health and employment support. It's, it's probably not as much fun as it would have been to just take the mickey, but it's a lot more interesting. And indeed, a lot more important. Sophie's in Cambridge. Sophie, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. Um, yeah, so um, I, I called in because this sort of reminded me of a situation quite a few years ago now where I was actually sort of referred for life coaching in a children's centre. Okay. Um, and um, the impact of that life coaching was just enormous. Um, it was completely life and was part of a sort of um, referral time um, which involved sort of social services and um, child protective services type so, so and, oh, I, I don't yeah. I mean I don't want you to I don't want to put, push you into saying things that you don't want to talk about but I just I need to if, if I can clar clarify a couple of things you were in a tricky situation in a and and the the referral to a life coach was based upon the idea that you could be helped to change your behaviour in a, in a way that would make... Is that right? That make um, you... the, the bit about the tricky situation, yes. Um, so we'd already um, exited a sort of high-risk domestic violence situation. Okay. But it was at a time where my child had just started um, preschool. So yes. we were sort of in a new system, if that makes sense. Obviously, yes, yes I, no, I understand. Support workers around, yeah. yes. Um, but 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 it wasn't. I I don't think it was kind of done at all on on the premise that there should be behaviours of mine that that needed to to change. No. Although I would have been sort of open to that. It was more just. I think one thing that um, I think either the last caller or if if there were two, the first one um, spoke about in terms of what what it did was provide me a sort of way to to be moving forward mm. in this awful mire of a situation in a way that again I'd, my experience of therapy not not to you know criticize but my, sure. my experience of therapy had been more unraveling this looking back okay. on that on, on picking so when that, i said behavior that was that that was the the, the wrong word it just cha it changes your attitude almost <clears throat> yeah and I, I think some of i mean what I got from the life coach, um, probably I could have found like in a book, on a website, in a whatever, you know, I'm sure it's all out there. But I think that idea of, sorry, that experience of meeting regularly mm. and quickly with someone was really powerful because yeah. I think I had six sessions which started within about two weeks. And at the same time, I was on a CBT waiting list where I think I had my first substantial appointment in 18 months kind of thing Gosh. so i think the availability of people is really relevant as well but certainly in terms of the returning to work or returning to something else that's important in your life that kind of that approach of the life coach and that you know the new sort of terminology or the tools yeah. or the scaffolding like was that's a great really phrase. that's impactful. a really good yeah that's yeah. a great analogy just yeah scaffolding that's a really strong I'm so glad. I'm so happy it worked for you. And and the way you describe it, it seems perfectly plausible that it would work for people who were stuck in a in a in a in a different sort of scenario. It helps you get unstuck, Sophie. I think is what I've taken from what you've told me. And I think. Oh, oh phone's gone. Uh, not your fault. Uh, uh, but, but very timely, actually, because we're bang on for the news with Amelia Cox. It is 33 minutes after 12, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Some amazing texts. Suzanne and Miles up next, talking about the idea that life coaches could help long-term sick people get back to work. A bit stupid of me at the outset to sort of frame it as if it were going to be somehow curing the, the physically unwell. It is much, much, much more likely to be focusing upon people with mental health problems or debt problems even, according to the some of the reporting today. And, and uh, you know, it seems to be feasible, plausible, possible, desirable even. Uh, James writes this, let me check who it's it doesn't sign, unsigned. I was a cynic re-life coaching, but I trained in it during lockdown and have been converted. I know you're au fait with therapy, so I thought a comparison might be useful. Therapy takes a person from non-functional to functional. 
whereas life coaching takes someone from functional to optimal. It's difficult to provide an all-encompassing definition as there are so many nuances, but at a high level in the context you are discussing, it can be very useful in terms of helping people to prioritise, to remove unnecessary stress and to focus on what works for them emotionally. I'm assuming here that doctors would refer those that are off work due to stress, so my concern would be that employers are not held responsible for people burning out due to the pressure of work. It must be kept in mind by both doctor and life coach that it may not be anything that the patient is doing wrong that has put them into this situation. That's incredibly helpful. It really is. And this is from Sally. I don't know, James, but I suspect that if I had had a life coach in my 30s, I would not now be in a wheelchair. I feel that my appalling life choices contributed to continued periods of obesity, which have kiboshed my health. I also had undiagnosed ADHD, and I now have fibromyalgia. And I think that being directed down a different path instead of being left to my own chaotic devices might have saved me a lifetime of misery. Sally, I'm so sad to read that. And Tricia says, I'm a newly retired psychotherapist. Good therapy doesn't just dwell on the past, but also explores how to move forward and often incorporates ideas of life coaching. Um, and I, 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 I've already read that one. That, that, that pretty much tallies with what I said a minute ago, didn't it, about plausibility and even desirability. I'm very glad I didn't go down the route of just being a bit of a mickey taker a stupid mickey taker because just because you don't know something or understand something doesn't mean you should be frightened of it or negative about it suzanne is in huddersfield suzanne what would you like to say hi james Hello. how are you very well what's on your mind um well i was listening to you and i just thought this god this subject hardly ever comes up mm. about coaching and i am a coach i wouldn't call myself a life coach mainly because i've got a phd in coaching okay and I sort of feel that the a bit like what your first caller said, that life coaching can sometimes be um, associated with very brief courses that people have been on. Right. It's got an Americanism about it. And so I would prefer to call it personal development coaching, yeah, which fair is what I, what I call myself. But I did my PhD on the use of coaching in social work. Right. And obviously, as you know, social workers are working with people often on the margins of society, often the long-term sick, often the long-term unemployed, often with historical trauma. And so I now train social workers in those skills, and I also have my own practice where I work with people, um, you know, in similar circumstances. So absolutely, it will help. But I guess the thing I wanted to put across was yeah. that you can't coach anybody against their wishes. So if somebody is sent somewhere to be coached, and they are sent there to get a job through coaching. That won't work. Coaching has to be entered into voluntarily. And it's really about finding meaning and purpose, ultimately. But, but it, I mean, yes. So I, I understand why you're making that point. But it doesn't rule out what we're discussing, does it? A GP could say, I'm, I think I might refer you to, and someone might quite like the idea. It depends partly on how the GP couches it, doesn't it? Phrases it, offers it, describes it, explains it. Yeah, yeah. But what I would say is often people don't understand what coaching is. And often, you know, like yourself, yeah. had some confusion about what it might be. And the best way, the best way to understand it is to try it, yes. understand that you really, you, you meet with somebody, it's a short-term intervention, it's very rarely a long-term intervention like therapy. Yeah. And you're really trying to understand somebody's reality. But you, the key thing that you're trying to do in any coaching session is encourage them to see that they have some power, some personal power. It may be that their circumstances cannot be changed, ah, okay. but yeah. you can change your relationship to the issue and the problems that you have, the way that you think about them, which is what you said earlier. It's a lot about mindset, attitudinal response. So that's why Sophie, that's so Sophie was talking about being a, just getting out of a, of, a, of a domestic violence scenario. And what you've yeah. just said was the missing piece of the jigsaw for me and just and just te teaching her that she has more agency, as it were, that she can approach things differently. I, I misphrased it when I said changing your behavior, because that almost makes it sound like victim blaming. But it's about changing the way you look at the world and your yeah. role, your place in it. Yeah. How much power do you have? Yeah. Where is your power? How can you activate it? And, well, I've, you know, my, my research looked at that in detail. Gosh. And I now, I now work in two of the most deprived local authorities in the UK. I work in Hartlepool yeah. and I work in Tower Hamlets. 
and it's been incredibly successful for the social workers using it. In fact, they can't get enough of it. <laughs> no, I can well imagine. Well, it gives them tools they didn't have before, which is yeah. particularly valuable. How did you get into it, Suzanne? Do you know what, James? I well, used to. I've been a social worker for 25 years. Right. And one day I was sent on a coaching course and didn't know what it was. And I was mandated to go, so I went. I went to it begrudgingly, yeah. and it was so transformational for me. Wow. All the time I was being trained, I just kept thinking, "Why don't social workers get this?" Uh. And so I left my job and all the security of the local authority to do the PhD. And, and that, then I did and that a was PhD it. And with have, social workers. And you haven't looked back. I haven't looked back. No, and so now I train other people on my research. Although, weirdly, my research is the only research in the world on the use of coaching in social work. And I, and I have my own private practice, but I don't just coach social workers. But coaching has existed for a long time in a very sort of elite space. Right. Um, where people oh, who are CEOs kind of no, get it. Of and it. I, yes, of course it has. Yeah. I, God, my, I hadn't my... put two and two together. I know people. I know what yeah, you're talking about. You do. And, yeah, they, and pay, they, charge, they pay they pay huge charge, sums. Yeah, they charge five hundred and the rest, mate. Quid for and an the hour. rest, yeah, and yeah, the rest. I mean, yeah, and I really cheap. <laughs> so I, I'm trying to make it accessible. Uh, I'm trying to create, you know, a, a democratised version of coaching. So I welcome this announcement. Yeah. But I find the I think they've chosen the term life coach because people have a general idea of what it could be, and I sometimes use it because it helps people to get on board. But, yeah, because basically you're not just talking about your work no. and you're not just talking about home because home affects work, work affects home. The pandemic really brought that into a really sh yeah, you know, sharp idea that we are whole people and coaching coaches the whole person. So you may go in there and, you know, the, the instruction is you need to get back to work. But actually, when you start understanding their reality going back to work may be one of the outcomes, but it can't be the only one because lots of other things will come and will come online as well once people start activating the power. That's beautifully put. And, and of course, I mean, the other point about your high-end, if you like, life coaching is that it, it just it improves. You move from functional to optimal. So if it can help people who yeah. are running FTSE 100 companies, then it can certainly help people who are at their, at their wit's end, can't it, who are, who are, who are struggling to, to hold it together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I do coach CEOs as well, Good. but the majority of my clients are social workers, NHS, I'm giving them stuff. Teachers. That's fantastic. I'm so glad you were listening to. Were you listening today, or did someone alert you to the fact that no, we were talking? I'm, listening. Well, I'm I just was checking. My daughter's come home from university, just getting a bedroom ready. And I thought, oh, that's me. <laughs> that's me. That is. She's talking about. <laughs> now that's really lovely. Thank you, Suzanne, and I hope you have a lovely time with your daughter as well. 12:42 is the time. Miles is in Highgate. Miles, what made you pick up the phone? Uh, hi there, James. Hello. Um, great to speak with you. Bear with me because I am a bit, um, a bit nervous. Take your time. Um, no problem. No worries. So I am. Um, long term um, off work um, yes. a, a couple of years ago I, I had some really catastrophic men, uh, mental health issues uh, okay. to, to the point where I, I tried to end my life um, on two separate occasions um, now the, the process that happened after that you know you go through the NHS you're in the hospital and they and they do set you up with a, with a therapist yeah. um, if, if they can and that's absolutely fantastic and I had trust in the person that I was talking to mm. uh, because I knew.
uh, that they had studied the mind and that they had the tools to give, you know, they had the tools that they could give me uh, basically to to help deal with my mental health issues mm. through years and years of study. And I could trust that. Now, but if I, if I were being referred to a life coach, I, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't trust it. I, I don't know how they've studied. I don't know why they've got into these things. And uh, but that might be our that. fault. That might be our because Suzanne, you just on before you has a has a PhD. I was listening, yeah, I, and I did actually. I find that really interesting. But yes. it's but when you're at that, that when you're at that low point, yes, of course, the the, the, the tiny things make massive impacts. They really, really do. And that is that trust has to be there. Of course it does. Now, I, I, I mean, we have gradations, don't we, of, of yeah. experience and condition on this. And I, I'd be very surprised if anybody was suggesting that someone in the position you were in didn't get the treatment that you received no, and, 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 and uh, instead got, got referred to, 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 to a life coach. I don't, I don't think that's... No, I know, but I, I mean, I, I think the heart of this issue though hmm. is is literally all about the nhs and, and, and waiting times frankly i think that the only reason why they're doing this is so that they can say look you know it takes six months to to get an nhs um therapist so have a have, in the meantime have a life coach i'm going to disagree with you actually on that I, th I think it's cynical in the sense that it's all about reducing the welfare bill rather than particular concern for the welfare of the people concerned but i have been persuaded over the 45 minutes we've been talking about this that there is a difference between a profound sure, in fact the, I, the point you began with is, is highlighting the profound difference between traditional therapy if you like psychotherapy and life coaching or, or personal development coaching and there'll be plenty of people who would benefit from one but not necessarily from the other absolutely and i, and I do want to make it mm. clear that i'm not disparaging life no, coaching at all. Not. I'm not. really not. Nope. I just I just think that different types of long term ill, which is what we're talking yes. about, long term ill people, yes. have very, very different needs and requirements. And you can't just funnel people into into one type of, of thing. No. And it sounds to me from because I have been listening to, to the conversation sure. as well. It is really interesting. But it sounds to me that life coaching is most beneficial to the people that go out and seek it for themselves because okay. they have that that want and desire yeah. and change to, to uh, or to change and improve their lives. And that's wonderful. It really is. But if we're talking about a different type of long term ill person, it's that not gonna change help. isn't always isn't always going to want to be there. They don't always want to change. And in, in my case, I, I literally you know, didn't want to exist. So you need a, you need a completely different <laughs> it's approach. A completely I'm, uh, different no, approach. it's a really important point. It really is. I'm glad. I'm, I mean, it's good to hear you laugh, actually, Miles, as you got. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I am, I, I'm, I am doing better. You good. know, I really am. But part of, of, of what a therapist can do isn't just, um, you know, the talking therapy isn't mm. just the, um, uh, it, the help there, but it's also, maybe getting you on, on the right medication of course as well no of course and, 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 and that's a massive thing yeah and we must and, and i think we've learned to be perhaps suspicious of motives we certainly wouldn't want a, a money saving exercise to see people in your situation denied the care and the treatment that you so clearly and desperately needed in, in and instead being given this but as we both have, have, have both understand and acknowledge people could benefit from this, uh, but but not people who are in the in the situation that you found yourself in, Miles. Thank you, mate. I, it's a big, really lovely to hear you laugh at the end. There, I'm so sorry for what you've been through. If if anything that Miles talked about touched upon you particularly, then do always remember that the Samaritans operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. There are various ways to get in touch with them. If you have a look at the website Samaritans.org, but the the best known, of course, is the phone line, and and you can ring 116111. 116123. That's 116123 for free any time um, of day or night. That, but you, you can also send an email to um, well, samaritans.org. Just have a look at Joe at the moment at joe at samaritans.org. It is 1248. <laughs>
12.51 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, looking at life coaching and learning a lot, actually, a, a huge amount. Seeing potential positives, obviously, as with any new policy or new approach, there, there will be concerns. The devil, as they say, is always in the detail. But there's a comment piece in the Times under the headline, Initi- an, an initiative that's worth exploring. That's one of the leading articles. I think that's pretty much where we are at the moment, isn't it? It's an initiative that is worth exploring. The two and a half million, I think the elephant in the room here is long COVID. I I, I really do. I think an awful lot of people have um, not fully recovered from COVID. All sorts of complications and, and long tails, if you like, on that. And the government doesn't really seem to have grasped that particular nettle. But when you're looking at, I, I guess, conditions that have been around forever, like stress, the idea that working on your mental health could help um, with the caveat that you don't want anyone to be getting the blame for ending up burnt out when it's the boss's fault or the employer's fault. It's, 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 well, as I say, it's an initiative that's worth exploring. Richard's in Windsor. Richard, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Yeah, I, I want to come over from another, I was a prison officer. Oh, yeah. And uh, I used to deal with a lot with the, the mentally and the criminally insane and I, but all, you know, long term lifers. But mm. also as well, I, I dealt with the day to day people as well, you know, the ones that basically made a mistake or, yes. you know, and, and I dealt with a lot of people who were depressed, down on the luck, you know, and, you know, some of them were on suicide watch and stuff. And I found that, you know, just taking the time out just to sit there and talk to them and just to explore different avenues and coping mechanisms yes. that they didn't have. Because remember, we all have different life experiences and some of us naturally have good coping mechanisms or what that's been taught by our parents. And then some of us don't. We have to pick these up by the mistakes that we make sometimes. Yes. And I found that, you know, people were always worrying about things in the future or living in the past. And not a lot of people were living in the now. And they're worrying about things that they can't control and worrying, and not worrying, you know, and not taking advantage of the things that they can control in their life today. And this is what I found with a lot of the prison. I say, well, you know, do a lot of things you're talking about you have no control over. Mm. But what can you control now at this time? And they were saying, well, I can control this, I control that. And I say, look, there is possibilities. You've got you've got coping mechanisms at hand which you're not utilising, you're not using. And I think that's I think with a lot of people in their lives, when it comes to self esteem, when it comes down on the luck, they just they see the doom and gloom. The thing that you know they're that's always a, too that, far that, in the that, future yeah, or too far in the past. That's you know? a, yeah. Well, you sound a little bit like um, Suzanne, the, the the actual who's got a doctorate, got a PhD in personal development coaching. That some of the things you said that then this came to you quite naturally, did it? The, 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 this, well, what's yeah. your background? I mean, uh, uh, well, personally, I mean, I, obviously, you know, I, I, I've just had the the the, the, the life school, you know. I yeah, mean, fair just enough. Of, I've made a few. I've made a few mistakes and whatever else, and you know. Then I went. You need on, to hear I, it from someone else sometimes, don't you? You can't. I mean, regardless of whether or not you could do it solo, you, you need to hear stuff from outside sometimes for it to it lands differently. It registers. It resonates differently. What's available in prison officially? If, if you weren't there, I mean, that, that, that I'm now wondering whether or not this should be extended into prisons. And, and, you know, you'd probably address recidivism, wouldn't you, by giving people the tools that they need to make a bit more of a go of things on the outside? Well, whatever it is, James, it's the trouble is that people are not trained to look, to do this. Prison officers are not trained no, in, this well, sort exactly. of, in this sort of thing. Because when you go to a counsellor, right? Well, you should be, shouldn't you? Because Suzanne's training social workers. She, she could be training prison officers as well. 100%. But when yeah. you go into this, you know, you go in front of a counsellor or anybody else and say, right, okay, you've told me this, I'll see you next week. Now, that week, has kept, that person's opened up mm. for an hour then they've got to carry all their emotions all week, then go back in another week and then basically start off with the left off. Just as, you know, and then what happens is when you talk to somebody, like you know, James, if you're talking to somebody or people talk to you, mm. they'll come off that phone sometimes, they're either feeling worse about themselves or better about themselves, yeah. you know? Yeah. And what it is, it's about when you come away from somebody and just even you've had a coffee or a chat or a tea, because people got to understand something. You've all got the ability to solve your own issues it's just you don't want to hear the answers sometimes to some of the issues that you have. So you would rather suppress them and bury them rather than basically exposing them to the light and saying, what can I actually do today to make my life better? Uh, yeah. and, that, and as soon as you answer, ask that question, automatically 
you're like, you know, it's, as long as they're those... open to it. As I mean, a lot of people are like, thank you, Richard. It's a, it's really interesting that, but of course, you can't you can't force people into these situations or these scenarios. But as you as you put it, they've almost come to you knowing that they need a little bit of help, and you luckily have the sort of emotional tools to to provide it um and, and i mean lucky as well because you know plenty of people in your old line of work who would be a million miles away from where you were in those sort of contexts it is 12 56 i'm short of time susie but I, i'll do my best to give you a good hearing what would you like to say firstly one of your biggest fans Thank so you, Susie. That's very i'm kind. incredibly nervous talking to you um i've got fibromyalgia and earlier than lost um Erla Samlos is a elasticity of um the soft tissue in your body so oh. I can dislocate things yeah. really easily. Um I think this plan is horrible. I think it's not meant for you, and it's 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 my fault that you thought it was when I started talking about it. I, 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 I mean, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody would come to somebody in your sort of situation and say that life coaching could make you fit for the workplace. I really don't, Susie. I mean, I appreciate you saying that, but we can't trust this government. That's true, too. That's true, too. They've cut the care hours. I now only get an hour and a half, and my evenings should include dinner and things like washing my hair. Mm. But there's not enough care staff to to extend my hours, even by half an hour, so I can have my hair washed. I go for a, a week without a shower because I can't do it on my oh, own. Oh, poor thing. Um, and it's, it's embarrassing, but they're cutting the funds everywhere. So they're saying that those that are on long-term sick, but they haven't specified... No, Those they haven't, and I'm going to make you a, I make you a promise now. If 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 there is even the vaguest suggestion that this would encompass and include people like you, then uh, I, I will I'll, I'll tear them a new one, Susie. Oh, I love you. Um. <laughs> I, I promise you that because I because I know what you're frightened of, and I know why, and you describe it perfectly. That erosion of what should be yours by rights. In the in the pursuit of cost savings, uh, and, and you're, I think we've all reached a point now with this lot where we wouldn't be surprised by anything that they tried next. But I did warn you that we were going to be short of time, so I, 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 I'm going to knock it on the head there and wish you all the very, very, very best. I really am. Uh, and that is it from me for another day. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can also rewind live radio. All LBC's shows are there to catch up on, as well as all of Global's live radio stations. So rewind live radio on Global Player. Download it for free from your app store or just go to globalplayer.com. Tom Swarbrick with you from 4. Sheila Fogarty with you now. 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 Sheila Fog